Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You can do better than that. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Go brave. <laughs> Woo! All right. I am so happy to be all here. Delighted Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll very, be very brief. Um, I'm here to listen today. I usually talk. But today, I want to hear from you guys. So bring your A game, show us what this is all about. We look forward to whatever you have crafted regarding the budget. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. If I haven't said it, y'all look so good in your blue. It is it, like a sea of excellence in here. I absolutely love the uniformity. So kudos to whoever thought of this. Um, I have my blue, and later on, I'm going to go in the bathroom and change. I want to be like y'all. But um, I just want to say, tell us what you need. Um, I think Ed will tell you, if you don't tell us what you need, you won't get it. But if you tell us, you just might what, Ed? You can just get it. So. Be courageous, let us know your needs, and we look forward to hearing from all of you. I reiterate what they say. They're saying, uh, I'm here to listen to you. It's your time. So. Thank you so much, uh, commissioners. With that being said, I'll call this meeting to order, and uh, it is probably about 9.10. And I am going to yield the floor to our county administrator, Sharon Subedan, and she'll take it from here. And certainly, uh, again, welcome, and we're excited to hear from you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present to you this morning. Um, good morning, Team Blue. You all look amazing, look terrific, looking great this morning. Thank you for coming out and being ready to share with our commissioners a little bit about what you do. Um, so I wanted to jump right on in and start with the uh, budget overview. Um, but I think it's important, right? In order to be able to focus forward, we still have to look back. And so 2021, last year around this time, the budget was balanced at a base budget of about 98 million. Um, in fiscal, in calendar 2021, which is also our fiscal year, the budget was amended numerous times, and our current budget is at about 115 million. And um, just to refresh your memory, those are things like carryovers, about $4 million in carryover purchase orders, and encumbrances from fiscal 2020. Um, the BIRs were added to the budget. We received several grants, yay, added to the budget. And then at the end of the year, when the minutes rate was adopted, we added to the budget. So that's our current budget amended. But those are not recurring revenues, so that is not our starting point. Our starting point has to be our base budget of last year at 98 million. So 
We did the budget process. I met with Madam Chair, join us on probably 90 plus percent of every budget hearing. I met with every department, every constitutional officer, elected officials, as well as our outside agencies. We went through the budgets line by line. And in general, I made no changes to the requests for elected officials and constitutional officers because I feel like that's your responsibility. And they present their budget. In some instances, they were willing to make some adjustments on things that they knew were gonna be under budget. But in general, their budgets remain unchanged. As we went through the budget, you all know that I shook you upside down. <laughs> I told you, now you don't need that money. I told Consuela, why do we need to send birthday cards? <laughs> and things like that. But at the end of the day, I have a proposed budget for you all to consider, having listened to every single department and including our outside agencies. So, when the, so everybody, what's the test? How much was last year's budget? Base budget? 98 million. So as we went through the budget department requests, they totaled up $109 million. So right off the bat, we had an $11 million difference between our base and department requests, but that was okay. I asked you to tell us what you need. Just like commissioners, you heard them say, tell us what you need. This year, um, we did something a little bit different than what you've done before, and we used a terminology called proposed additions to core. It's similar to your BIR process, but proposed additions to core, we, we um, shortened it, we called it PATSI, are those things that you really would like to have in your budget, but they're not part of your base. They're not part of your salary, your supply. These are things that you would really like to see happen. And so we calculated all of the passes, and they were 25 million. So total requests from departments, 134, 375, 853 million dollars. That's a, our total recurring revenue based on our digest is 104, 631, 524, leaving a difference of 29,744,329. So clearly, you know, I've heard you all say we have $1 with $10 worth of need. So this is one more example of what it is you already know. We have way more need in our base requests, in our addition to core requests, then we have revenue to be able to provide. Um, so I will say off the bat, uh, there are a couple of things in this current year budget that we are going to need to carry over again. Um, projects that are incomplete, grants that we just received that we're not possibly gonna spend by December. So things like um, those two grants, things like the DDS facility, which more, to, more conversation on that later today, um, we will have to carry over those items. In the past, you've done that as a budget amendment in January. Uh, one of the things I wanna talk about is should we build that into our base budget? Rather than getting a budget approved in December and in January, we carry forward things that we already know we're gonna have to do. They are one time, they're not recurring, they're one time expenditures, but these are things that I think we should build into our base budget. We have to identify them as one time, non-recurring, but I feel that it's better stewardship to outline them in our budget rather than adopt a budget, have hearings, let people vote on those, you know, speak on those, vote on those, and then in January, we make an adjustment. It seems like we're, we're kind of not cognizant of what's coming forward, but we do know. We do have a pretty thorough list of the things that we're going to have to carry forward because there was just no way to complete them in 2021. Any questions so far? All right, so I'm gonna sit down now and figure out how we're gonna get to 29 million. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Roz will tell you, we've lost a little bit of sleep <laughs> trying to figure out how to get this money, this, this number and this number to work together. Um, but I do have to say the team has been phenomenal. People have been very helpful, cooperative. Everybody participated in the budget process in a good spirit. And so um, after me today, we're gonna have what's called rapid fire. 
So some of you have probably been to conferences where there's rapid fire sessions. Mm -hmm. Departments are gonna come up, they're gonna present, they're gonna give you their top you know, four slides, and we're gonna ask you to, we're gonna do it by team, according to our organizational chart, and then we're gonna ask you to <coughs> hold the questions till the end of the team, so that we can kind of get everybody through it. This will not be obviously your only opportunity to talk with directors, but I felt like it was important because this is the budget, right? This is what we do. This is who we are, everybody in this room. And so I thought it was important for them to participate in this process and give you feedback. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So again, our recurring revenue, 104, 631, 524. My proposed budget is 103, 577, 085, giving you a difference of a million dollars. Not a lot to put towards that $29 million deficit, but this covers our base. A couple things in this base are, are things that are now recurring that we really can't get away from. Um, one of them is the operating cost for this facility. You know, you build it, they come, then we have to pay to operate it. Um, another thing that's recurring in the base budget is um, boundary waters. We build it, they come, now we have to operate it. So that's in our base budget. The other thing I put in the base budget was, that's significant, there are some small things, um, is mowing and litter pickup. Um, I think we have eight cycles, six cycles in the budget, um, which is, I think, <coughs> two more than this current year, because we know the grass is going to grow, the trash is going to be there, and what happened this current year is we really didn't get out there and start doing that till well into May. By then the grass was long, people were complaining. And so I felt like that was a base service that you would expect of us, so I put it in our base budget. You have the authority to change it. This is my proposed budget. The details are in your book by, um, by departments and by, um, by subject area. Lots more, lots more conversation to be had, but this is my proposed budget. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Fred, who's next up, to start our rapid fire. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board of Commissioners. Start for me. Um, so I'm 6'1, I'm 180. I'm the starting shooting guard for Team Blue. Okay. Right. I put up points, I put up buckets, that's what I do. Okay, I put up buckets. Um, can I have my slides up? But no, in all, in all uh, seriousness uh, to the Board of Commissioners, I do want to thank you all for approving the reorganization of Douglas County. Uh, without that, we all probably wouldn't be sitting here this is my first time actually intimately being involved in this whole process. So I thank you all. Um, I do believe I'm the first deputy county administrator. So I am so excited about that. Um, thank you all. So I'm elated to, uh, to serve under uh, Madam Subedan, elated to uh, serve alongside all these people in blue. These are all my teammates. So I know that Madam Chair likes to use the sports analogy so does uh, Commissioner Robinson. So you will hear a lot of that as we go through. And I am just filibustering until my slides come up. <laughs> Rambling somewhat. Actually, I was thinking uh, that next year, instead of this, we do a little talent show. So everybody comes up and they do their little talent. And uh, <laughs> I can do that. But it has been a very, uh, you know, since August 31st, it has been a learning experience. Um, we have been drinking out of the water hose. This is me. All right. Oh. One more. There we go. So um, 
I am uh, the Deputy County Administrator, and Operations Division falls under my purview. So what is the Operations Division? It consists of support services, as well as public work support services, consists of human resources, risk and safety, uh, records administration, uh, procurement, CIP, uh, and SPLOS. Uh, public works consists of street maintenance, right-of-way fleet, solid waste, and landfill. So we have a lot of uh, very core services that, uh, that we provide to the county. I'm excited to provide those uh, services to the county, but on the flip side, we our phones are ringing off the hook. We get the we probably get the most most most, uh, most phone calls. I think my first three to five years, I knew Heath and I would see him a lot. We were speaking passing. We are joined at the hip now. That's right. That's right. I know his family. I love his wife, his kids, everything. <laughs> I think neither Heath is the first person I speak to in the morning. But uh, these are the services that we provide in the, um, in the operations division. And uh, I, I couldn't ask for a, bet, a better set of directors to fall under my purview. All of them are extremely professional, extremely knowledgeable about what they do. I didn't think I could find anybody that knew more about their subject than, um, than Milton. Milton knows about elections like, I've never seen anybody that knows elections like that. But Aubrey knows records administration just as good. So um, I think I might have the employee of the year here. So we all subscribe to terrific values. Um, these are uh, the things that we look to every day that give us direction, trust, effectiveness, responsiveness, <laughs> respect, um, integrity, fun, in innovation. And the last point being customer satisfaction. Who's our customers? external customers, internal customers. Uh, we are here to uh, serve the citizens of Douglas County, support the mission of the Board of Commissioners. So as, as we go through all of our presentations, you will hear different variations of each of these uh, value points. Uh, in operations, in the operations divisions, our areas of focus are these, I won't read them to you. I've just been flashed and my time is about to go up. So records management, I mean, uh, as you can imagine, we've been getting uh, open records requests out the wazoo, just rapid fire, uh, things of that nature, compensation benefits, employee relations, all of those things fall under our purview. Um, so these are some of our area, our key areas of focus under the operations division. These are our goals, just some of our, uh, uh, just a few of our goals that we're gonna focus on moving into the new year. So these are some of the things that point to our uh, five-year strategic plan. And again, thank you all for adopting that. That gives us a clear path and a clear uh, indication of what we're to be working towards. Uh, some of the things uh, on our performance evaluations also point to that strategic plan. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, everybody's on I-20 headed west. Nobody is, uh, is heading uh, in different directions. We know exactly where we're going. So uh, with that, I am going to allow uh, my team to come up and start to put meat on the bones. And I want you all to give it up for Aubrey Britt. some of our unanticipated challenges and accomplishments. I want to start with the challenges. We had more benefits and positive things this year, but one of our unanticipated challenges was turnover in our electronic records and information coordinator position. Historically speaking, that position is difficult to keep filled because it has a really high workload and low compensation. But this year, you guys actually saw fit to give me a part-time position, which I really appreciate because now this year, when we lost that electronic records person, we were able to transition smoothly to part-time position into the electronic records position so we did not lose out on any productivity. Actually that position allowed us to increase our productivity in our imaging by 493%. So a couple of the accomplishments that we have <coughs> excuse me, are that increase in productivity in relation to imaging. 
And we're also able to assist personnel in creating a web-based resource for them to have personnel files accessible digitally rather than having them on paper so that we can actually try to move everything forward. So some of our comparative numbers. In our open records request, again, we deal mostly with open records in archives. Um, so just from 2020 to 2021, we had a 31% increase in our open records request. The positive side of that is with a 31% increase in open records request and with you guys' approval to purchase an oversized format scanner, we were also able to increase our open records fees by 48% versus last year, which will make us pay for that scanner by the end of 2022. So um, one of the reasons why we have an increase in open records request is because our population continues to grow. As the population grows, requests are going to grow. Also, cases are going to grow. We're going to have more civil and criminal cases in the courts, which means there's going to be an increase in records that are sent to archives for us to maintain. So we had a 32% increase, which we were actually surprised about because um, with the decrease in courts because of COVID, we kind of expected that there would be a decrease in the number of archives that were transmitted, but that was not the case. So um, that just shows that as the, as the county continues to grow, all of our needs and our responsibilities are going to continue to grow with the county. Right now, we have three employees, the, myself, the electronic records coordinator, and our records, part-time records clerk. Hoping you guys see fit to continue that. It was a part-time temporary position. It would be really cool if y'all didn't discontinue it. <coughs> so I mentioned that our increase in imaging productivity was 419% from 2020 to 2021. I will just kind of throw out there, in the last five years, we've actually increased by 973% in imaging. So we're really trying to move the, full, the county forward from a paper platform into a digital <coughs> records platform, which makes things more accessible, both to the county, to internal customers and departments, as well as for us for open records purposes. So with our increased abilities in our imaging, we are also coordinating with a number of departments to identify imaging projects. Um, our appraisal department has an imaging project for property record cards, which are permanent records. They're accessed regularly by taxpayers um, when they're appealing property taxes or when they're just trying to understand where their tax payouts come from. Um, we also, again, we set up the bones of a project for our personnel department to digitize all of the personnel records. So we're hoping to get with them next year to actually begin the imaging process and make those available in a digital platform. Um, because we also have the new electronic records that transitioned into that position, we're hoping that with training funds we'll be able to attend the Georgia Records Association conference next year. They go over training for open records policies and procedures, records related to retention requirements, and just general records management procedures so that we can keep all of the records that we have in archives that are permanent, well stored, and um, maintained so that we can also access them if you guys ever have a need for them. We also complete an inventory every year. Um, so we have about 14,200 cubic feet of boxes for 29 different departments in the county with over 640,000 uh, records individually indexed in a database that makes it where all of the county departments can contact us if they have a need to have their records delivered to them, or they can contact us if they need to know about any storage or um, retention or any other procedures. That's all I have for you guys. And the next person, I don't remember who that Dawn. is. Dawn? All right.
The print shop work orders, we filled 113. <coughs> the impressions from print shops, we have 506,825. Paper orders, thus far, 123. Paper deliveries, 2,959,725 sheets. The mail pieces that have been processed, 134,694. Our goals for 2022, to efficiently and effectively administer all procurements, to modify, improve existing purchasing systems to facilitate the needs of all county departments, to comply with the legal requirements of public purchasing, to assure vendors that impartial and equal treatment will be afforded to all who wish to do business with Douglas <coughs> County, to receive maximum value for each public dollar spent, to provide each department the requested goods and services in the proper quantity and quality at the time and place needed, to improve the efficiency of processing printing work orders, to improve the quality of all printed materials, to conduct timely delivery of all printed materials, to foster effective communication with the departments working directly with them to meet critical needs, to continue to improve the efficiency of mailing processing for all departments, to improve delivery time of all sensitive and accountable mail. The next two slides are the county administrator's proposed budget for Department 195 and 145. Next we'll have on our team, Latifa Terry Bowles. She'll be presenting for HR. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? I'm happy to be here. Um, I am Latifa Terry Bowles. I am the Human Resources Generalist um, and most recently Acting Manager now. I've been with the team. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Um, so I've been with the county for about four years now, and um, Frederick kind of just went over an overview of what we do. Um, but I'll just reiterate that, and that is um, employment, employee relations, uh, salary and benefits administration, as well as some things that fall under that. It would be position control, report for the departments, as well as maintaining the pay scales in the classification code. <laughs> so, of course, in 2020, we faced some challenges um, as it regards to COVID. And I think some of those challenges spilled over into 2021. So there have been some, um, with the new protocols, um, a little bit of challenges, having just to be able to learn them, to implement them and educate the employees in regards to them. Um, employee engagement kind of took a dip as well because you know we were in the physical space before and then going into the virtual space you know, it kind of took a dip, but still we were able to transition and be able to um, afford those opportunities to the employees. Um, we have um, some key vacancies that we need to fill as well. Um, so we have filled some of them, but um, at the same time, of course, there is challenging, it's, you know, with the market. And we had a frozen position in our department, so we were functioning as well on limited staff to our limited staff. But yet and still that position was restored. So with all that, I just would like to say, even though it was challenging, it was also accomplishments. So I just wanted to kind of put it together to show, you know, we got through that. Oh, our comparative analysis. So um, I'll just go over a few of the numbers. So for 2020, we processed over a thousand NOPAs. Um, 1176 to be exact and if you don't know what the NOPA is it stands for notice of personnel action and um, it starts in the departments they sent it over to us um, we just make sure the information is correct we verify it and then we implement it into the system for 2021 we'll be way over this number <laughs> already we're at 990 we have a lot more changes to come you see the total number of employees that we had, 1796 in 2020, 1803 in 2021. Um, and that includes our poll workers as well. 
Um, but I do have to say, we get complimented all the time on how we're doing such a great job. Um, we are a small department, yet yeah, a mighty department. And they're shaking your head because they agree. <laughs> so we are a team of four full-time um, full employees and one part-time person. However, it is our goal to be more responsive. And I think um, through the use of technology, um, more staff uh, will be able to do that. These are our goals. Um, I wanted to make sure I was specific because Madam Superdan says SMART goals. So I put them in quarters so we make sure we have our little timeline here. And I just want to say we are super excited uh, to be working with um, IS on implementing the HR and benefits module for the employees. <laughs> we are super, super excited. I will say that again. And it's been a long time coming. We are starting training next week for that, so we are super excited. Um, so we'll be getting that, and just to run quick a little bit for the things that will allow employees to be able to, you know, view their pay stuff. I know finance will be happy as well. They won't have to print out the um, the uh, pay devices, and um, they'll be able to view their accruals as well as their benefits and make change to that tax information. Quarter two, definitely looking into implementing the supervisor training. We will be um, covering like FML, FMLA, retirement, as well as the overall processes. And this will um, just be like helpful to the new managers and the supervisors. Uh, quarter three, um, we would like to streamline our onboarding process and utilize the technology that we have. And quarter four, um, thanks to the records department, we do have the software and want to make sure we have all of our active employees and our retirees, all their electronic files scanned. And of course, we would always want to implement the mission, vision, and goals of the BOC. So, you know, some of these things are dynamic and some of them are static, but we definitely want to work with you guys and make sure we get that implemented. And this is our budget for the year, our proposed budget for the year. And I know we're not um, <laughs> having questions, so I will turn it over to the next. Who is next? Okay, Mr. Laverne. My name is Matt Laverne. Uh, I am your Risk and Safety Director, and uh, my job is to direct the functions of risk management, safety management, as well as loss prevention. Now, the mission of Risk and Safety is to provide superior risk management programs, superior safety plans, as well as services that protect the physical and financial well-being of Douglas County's uh, personnel, workforce, and assets. With that being said, um, going through, uh, getting into our PowerPoint here, and first going over some of our accomplishments and unanticipated uh, uh, challenges. Uh, you know, risk and safety as well as Douglas County as an organization has gone through a good bit of change and growth that it may not even uh, be recognizing in, at some levels. For example, in the insurance market, once you hit 100 million in revenues, everything changes. It's kind of like uh, hitting the next tax bracket, okay? Uh, once you hit over 100 million, then insurance companies, as far as the different ways to manage and transfer out risk, they all become different. Um, you know, risk management here at Douglas County has had its, or risk and safety has had its own challenges. So uh, in the same year or two that we hit over 100 million, we're uh, in uh, revenues and our budget, we're also uh, moving into new offices, have 100% turnover in uh, professional staff or key personnel. Uh, we have, uh, fortunately, by the good graces of, uh, of our uh, county administrator and our board of commissioners, thank y'all for allowing us to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, restore those positions and get back up to speed. Uh, we have set up our new offices. We have set up the workstations, the new simulator that we plan on integrating into uh, driver training this year. Uh, uh, we've got a new training room that's going to be versatile uh, for, uh, that'll serve the needs for uh, 
uh, most if not all departments. Still working on a variety of different uh, insurance structures for the Board of Commissioners to present in 20, uh, uh, 2022. And uh, we've done a variety of things, uh, revenue programs like extradition uh, reimbursement programs. Uh, this year we've seen an increase of 14% in insurance uh, premiums versus a recent history of 21 and 22%. So uh, I find that to be uh, very positive. We do have to keep in mind that we there's a lot of Atlanta that's going to be reopening in January. It's my understanding. It's uh, what is predicted from underwriting uh, for a variety of ways. Some of our challenges, you know, uh, stuff, you know, all of it manageable, but, uh, you know, punch list with a new facility, uh, 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 employee availability for training, uh, uh, resources, different frozen markets in the insurance arena. Now, uh, as a comparative analysis, at first on this slide, I just wanted to say, hey, we're doing better this year than we were last year, and with a thumbs up. But I thought I'd go a little more in depth than that. All right, so this time last year, in, in November of 2020, we had 79 open claims. This year, we've got 90. Um, you can see that uh, in like driver orientations, for example, in a six-month period, in a 12-month period, by myself, I was able to do... Uh, uh, 63, and uh, uh, in the last five months we've been able to do 52. All right, just by being, uh, and this is through the up, um, bringing up new staff. Um, like I said, we've got uh, you know we're spending roughly two and a half to three million a year on uh, insurance premiums. We look at looking at a variety of ways of bringing that down, to add more to uh, your fund and uh, super down. And uh, as you can see, workplace injuries uh, have come down a little. Uh, there are still, I believe, some working from home. And, um, but uh, this is right around where we would expect to be for, uh, for uh, risk and safety at this point in time in its life cycle. So like we're 80% uh, up on that bell curve heading towards maturity in 2020, we hope to uh, conduct a safety board election. We're going to continue training staff and developing our core uh, uh, skills and abilities. We're going to uh, be conducting inspections of all Douglas County owned uh, facilities. We hope to produce a, a safety orientation video so we don't have to repeat it the same thing every week or every day, uh, day in and day out, and hope to perfect that. We're going to increase the quantity of uh, disease control classes for all departments. Um, and uh, prepare and present new auto and insurance structures to the Board of Commissioners. And I've got some real good structures. We're looking forward to bringing those to your attention. Uh, we've got safety plans to update, and we will continue to reduce vehicle accidents and injuries while working with Connect Douglas. And I believe that sums it up, and thank you all for your time.
right? Um, you know, it's been a while, but because of that, we've, uh, we're able to be innovative. The leaders we have here, I need that. Okay. Yep. All right. The leaders, I'd like to touch on real quick for Fleet, and is uh, Ross Clark and Vicki Stevens. Um, light side vehicle repair is Barry. Uh, Blanky ship and heavy side is Brandon and Spruill. These guys, Fleet is successful because of them. Not so much me. I keep them in the right direction. These guys and, uh, and girls are in charge of every day. That's who you deal with. And super proud of them, so I'll make sure I give them all the credit. Um, let's see, and then, you know, we've, the biggest thing we, we've done great for Fleet um, and challenges as well, and it's probably like that with all departments, is because of um, having short staff, because of whatever, COVID made a lot of first times for everybody. And everybody here in Fleet and uh, the other departments are very innovative um, and creative. And they came up with different ways to, to meet the goals, keep you on the road, and keep us operating at either understaffed or with a, in a smaller budget than we would like. Um, but we've innovated. Um, we've been able to strip um, parts off of vehicles, mainly sheriff's department vehicles, vehicles that get, they get in a lot of crashes. Uh, so if something is, is not going to work, we keep it. We harvest parts, good parts, that are perfectly safe, and we rotate them on. And because of that, we have carcasses of vehicles out there in the parking lot that we literally, there is nothing left by the time we send that, and then we get money for recycling metal off, off of it. So. When I say we do, we do as much as we can to keep people on with nothing. I, that's what I mean. I mean bare bones carcass, and then we get paid for that too. All right. Um, this is you can look over this while I'm talking. It's just a comparative between 20 and 21. Um, you can see we're higher in every category but one and that's road calls completed and the year's not over with yet we got 19 to go i'm sure we'll make goals for 2022 all right so we're going to continue to repair uh think about innovative new ways to accomplish our mission and uh and continue to recycle our parts and get the most out of what we already have in the future. Um, you know, we, we started training with GM. That's a big deal. GM, uh, we got some software, and uh, thanks to the board, they approved it. We have some software updates. So thank you very much. Uh, that, that's like diagnostic updates, and probably most importantly is the train, train the trainer type program we've started, initiated. GM sends a tech out to fleet. Every single technician in that building has been trained and is certified at the beginning level of GM, which is it's continued education, it makes their value better, it makes our force more professional. And apparently it fills slots, because like I said, we're full. Right? People like to get something out of their job other than a paycheck. Here is fleet management um, <coughs> proposed budget. Landfill, all right, I'm gonna try to speed up guys. <coughs> Accomplishments, let me just say with this, I can sum it up with the landfill has, uh, has definitely increased. Everybody during COVID time frame. Um, who cleaned out their house? Who cleaned out their basement? Who cleaned their yard? Who did that project that has been off for years and years, right? Everybody did. Guess where you take, you took it? You took it to me. Right, so while we're wearing masks and we're socially distanced and every every other safety precaution that has come down the line that are needed, we're doing, and we're doing it with a smile. You just can't see it underneath our mask most of the time. That's probably a good thing. But uh, you know, we're getting the job done. We we have to get out there, and we we have non we have like 
other people, uh, management out there selling tickets, myself out there selling tickets to get people around the, uh, <coughs> around the scales to weigh in. Because as you know, a good bit of the people who come in are just, you know, one time mom and pop cleaning out projects and they have a 500 or less flat fee, five and seven dollars. So those you can walk down the line and actually sell the tickets for. And that's what we do when they go around. And we're moving on. Comparative analysis. Goals. I want to say this, even if I'm over the goals for the uh, transfer station. RFP for the transfer station approved by the BOC and the bid awarded. That is my goal for 2022. I would like to see construction started before this year's over. 2022. Um, that's a big goal, but it's a big need and it's crucial, it's vital to this whole county. Uh, one other thing I have to touch on before I go to the next is uh, sanitation fees. Sanitation fees are things that have been cut out of last year's budget. It's something that we put into this year's budget and that was paid attention to and understood fully this time. So thank you very much. We cannot operate a transfer station without the fees to pay the transfer, the republic. Okay? Public works, new guys to the team. Uh, it's really me. And they're doing great. <laughs> I got three of them. Yes, public works, go. Okay, all right, public works. All right, let me just say Levon. Let me say Miguel. He's in the room. Miguel uh, was over it for the majority of the year and is great and has a great team. I stepped into something that was easy for me to jump into and lead and, and these guys are, are doing it. They, the biggest thing I want to point out here uh, is four cycles of litter pickup in 2020, zero in 2021. What did we do about that? We got out there and picked up the trash. Up and down the road, cut grass. If it was rain, could cut grass. We were picking up trash. And uh, everything in between, potholes. You name it, we're doing it. All right? I threatened to get out there myself. But I was going to take, you know, the city's uh, manager, Greg, Greg Baker, and pull him out there and take Rick Roberts. That's right. Yeah. Because we, we did, we even picked up their streets and cut their grass. So. I'm over, but I want to say thank you for everything you've added to help us become better and be more competitive. And uh, that's all. I'll answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody that's on the operations uh, division, come up please, or just real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. And we just want to give uh, the Board of Commissioners uh, an opportunity to ask any questions they might have, uh, and they will pass along to uh, uh, our Assistant County Administrator, Mrs. Tiffany Stewart-Stanley. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. So staff at the DOT is critical and will help out. We are 10 personnel vacancies right now, um, which is a significant <laughs> amount of the team that is missing. Um, and we have put in, you know, we've, we've moved them into new buildings. We're, trying, we're in the process of actually 
either building or purchasing a already bought building the county owns having it put it. Um, these are still in the planning stages, but we have moved the, the lower leadership into the house um, where they had offices, where the senior leadership was, <coughs> excuse me, and, and has been for a while. Uh, we moved those to Fleet using offices we have upstairs already. Uh, so it's working out great. Uh, we moved, we gave the job trailer where everybody was packed in is now just the, the employees that come in, the hourly, so they can clock in and clock out, kind of their base to start from. So you know, they're, they're grateful to even have that. And, uh, and they know that we ain't stopping. And y'all aren't stopping with that. We're not, we're not, we're happy for it now, but it's, it's a, a transition to something better. And you said there were 10 openings. I know you want to fill all 10, but, but what, what is it that you really need? And why do you think we have 10 openings? Is it because of pay? Is it because of the transition? Yes, ma'am. So it is pay? It's pay. Okay. And so just tell me, what is the average, right? This is Douglas County. We're not Fulton. We're not Cobb. Mm -hmm. you know, but at least what should be expected for Douglas County DOT worker hourly? Uh, $15 an hour uh, at a minimum is, gotcha. is what, you know, and that's lower than some, but that's, that, let's start there. Gotcha. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And purchasing. Same question in regards to the mail room. I know that there's a shortage, and I know our, our mail team is understaffed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and what? I'm currently out on um, the COVID. Oh, okay. So on um, our print shop guy, mm -hmm. personnel, he has been having to manage the print shop as well as the mail. So that department needs a full-time and a part-time? or Additional would be great, because um, right now each one is staffed with one individual. Okay. Okay. But your department for purchasing is? For purchasing, um, we're currently down um, one personnel that needs to be filled. Okay. So this is what Latifah was talking about when she said key roles that we, we've got to fill. And so my next question is to you, when it comes to filling these roles, what are the applicant pools looking like? Um, well, first we need to make sure like once the role is vacant that we, um, the de departments get with us as soon as possible so we can make sure that we um, draft the job description and we can make it more attractive to the um to the market or what it may be and just um it's just that's just a process i mean the market is right now um you know there's a lot of programs and a lot of um other additional monies that people can get so everybody isn't really looking to work all the time so we got to do our best to kind of just make it more attractive can technology help with that a little bit more? Yes, technology would help. Um, it would help a lot um, as far as filtering through like the applicant. Because right now, if if we have a position open, we have to filter through them, you know, ourselves. And I know the departments do that as well. You know. That is it. I think I'm I'm good. Y'all did a great job, by the way. Um, Aubrey, uh, you mentioned the um, archive area that is already taken up. How does your space look for the next couple of years? We have about 4,000 um, open spaces left. That's right. Um, if, if everything goes according to plan and the departments that have existing records and arch archives actually coordinate with us to do the destruction when records are eligible for destruction, and we should be able to do with the existing space for the next 10 years without having to add anything additional. However, we have looked at it long term. There is a yard area outside where, because we did move into the old jail, there is a yard area. Currently, it's uncovered, but our long term goal that we discussed with the um, board many, many years ago, it's a different board now, was to potentially cover that yard area and use that for additional storage space. So you do have a retention schedule that you go by and you destroy the documents after so long of retaining we, them? Well, we do coordinate with the departments. We just maintain the records for them. So we do require department approval for the records as they become eligible. So mm -hmm. once they are eligible based on our existing retention schedules, we verify that the retention schedule has not changed 
through the Georgia Archives. If it has not changed, we reach out to the department heads that own the records, ask them if they have any reason to designate them for continued retention. If they don't and they give us approval to proceed, then we follow the secure guidelines, um, which Georgia Archives also teaches us about, and make sure that the records are destroyed. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, with Heath, um, uh, you were saying that you need a transfer, need transfer station. Yes, ma'am. What is the estimate on that? Uh, the last estimate we have is three point five million dollars, mm -hmm. uh, and that would be for a, a roughly three times the size facility, uh, just innovated in all the ways that are common practice on a current transfer station now versus what we have. Um, and I know you've all, all heard it. I'm not. It, it was a structure that was built temporarily 20, over 25 years ago. So, you know, these guys, we're doing the best we can. We patch it, we put band aids, and, uh, and we really want to fix it. I don't want to see anybody, you know, have to go through that transfer station any longer than they have to. I want new, and everybody else does. And that's their place of business, that's where they, they go to. And you know that let's make it let's make it better for them. And will it speed up the process? Absolutely. Okay. It'll, it'll speed up. What I want, what the new building would have three tunnels versus one. Uh, just it'll have scales in the floor. You don't have to move and get in line with the tractor trailer. So it, it would significantly increase. Now, when I was out there disposing, uh, and of a, an old dryer, there were many um, appliances out there. Do you ever recycle those or we, sell for? We sell, we sell and recycle. So uh -huh. we have a vendor that um, we get right now currently eight dollars a, a piece of equipment. That's the average. He loads up the ones he wants. That money goes into the enterprise fund. Uh, for the landfill. Um, anything else that is not working enough for somebody to use for parts, it goes in the scrap metal. We recycle that. Okay, and one last question. Uh, I noticed on your uh, PowerPoint that you had zero for millings. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, now, <laughs> uh, there's going to be a cost to take the millings that we already have in stock. Yes, and have them all chewed up so we can use them next year. Correct. Do you have those funds in your budget? It is all in the budget. Okay, so the, when you said million zero, you... That means we have not put any millions out yet. And, okay. Uh, and we're, and as you know... But you've got two stockpiles right now. Absolutely. We have, we have enough to do uh, the goals for next year with mm -hmm. you know, the roads that you want to see. Um, fixed with the millings. The, as you know, the winter time is when you like chew them up. Is the time you chew them up exactly. Uh -huh. And then um, the summers when you in the heat of the summer, so the the compound can bond together again. Or else you're just putting it out there and it's going to wash out. We've actually tried it. All the counties tried it. It will not last unless you put them down in the heat of the summer. So. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope everyone is having a great day. I just want to say, isn't this great that we're all here together working, working on the goals for the Cats? I'm excited about this. But I also want to say that I, too, am a former athlete. Right. I am a basketball player. I used to play four. You probably could get about eight points out of me, but you're probably going to get about 12 rebounds, because I was really good at rebounding. So. Right. Okay, so first of all, I just want to thank the Board of Commissioners and our County Administrator for having the vision to create the Intergovernmental and Community Services Division, or like I like to call it, the ICSD. Um, I would say this. It has been two months of a lot of work, but it has been two months that has really opened my eyes about what goes on in Douglas County. And I have to say that I feel like the intergovernmental and the community service division is kind of like the heart of the community, 
because we are working very hard to serve the community. So, my team and I, we got together and we worked on a mission statement. Now, of course, we subscribe to the mission goals, values of the county, but we came up with a mission that we kind of felt like kind of incorporated everything that we all do. But I'm not gonna read this because at the heart of it, it is being committed to the community and doing it well. And I have to say, we are working hard at that. So I'm gonna kind of go over the areas. So with the intergovernmental, we still have our legislative and policy initiatives, advocacy, liaison to all levels of government, special projects, um, things like the census and redistricting, <coughs> things like that. And then we still are engaging the community. So we've got public engagement. We're the liaison to our community stakeholders, including our community organizations and nonprofits. Our Douglas County Youth Commission, which our commissioners just got, all of them came and spoke to our young people, and they're really excited about their, we're starting our new year. Uh, the Synthesis Academy, Volunteer Douglas, which is something we're trying to really incorporate volunteering into our county and keeping up with those numbers and making sure that people know you can come into our county, you can volunteer, there's a place for you. And then of course, working very hard to keep Douglas County beautiful, as always. So, the heart of our division are these four departments. Connect Douglas, Juvenile Programs, Library Services, and Senior Services. And I just wanna say, over the past two months of observing these departments, I really have got to see the passion and commitment that these directors put into our community. And I found that these departments are a place of hope. And they really are, because when you think about Connect Douglas, there are people who are trying to get to their jobs, they're trying to get to the doctors, and Connect Douglas gives them hope that they can get there, that they can better themselves, they can be okay from their doctors. <coughs> Juvenile programs. They have to be some of the hardest people I've seen working. Um, are you gonna keep telling me? Okay. They have to be some of the hardest people that I've seen working. I have been to that department and I have seen them work diligently for our children, our parents, and our community and make sure that they, you know, have everything that I need. Library services, once again, hope to better yourself to learn to educate yourself, to have fun, to learn a new class to do different things. And of course, what we are now, this beautiful building, senior services. Hope for our, our, our seniors that they can be active and have a great life. And especially my dad, he comes to, he goes to Woody Pike, so there's hope for me that he'll have something to do. Very excited. <laughs> All right, and so, next. These are the things that we aspire to. And when I say aspire to, we are already working as a team to do that. We are aspiring to, and we are doing this, providing exceptional customer service. Our goal, we have all committed that if you come into any Douglas County facility that is under the ICSD, if you get on that bus, if you get, go to the library and check out the book, I want you to feel like you've had an exceptional customer service experience. And we're gonna work very diligent, we're gonna work very hard, and we are all committed to doing that. Um, we're gonna build a connected community. This is very important. I feel like these programs really connect together when you really think about it. Senior services can connect with the libraries. Connect Douglas, you can use to take the bus to get some of these things. And then juvenile programs, once again, being there for our parents and our kids in our community. <coughs> we are working very hard to provide collaboration and teamwork for success. And then also, we are going to be very creative and innovative. I think that you have to when you're working with the community, you have to use innovation. You have to be creative. And I think when, in ICSD, that's something that we're gonna work very hard at. So these are our goals. I will be conducting a comprehensive review of the division and implementing strategies to increase our efficiency. We're going to create new and innovative programs and services to engage our community. We will be expanding staff and resources by looking for things like grants, working together, and we want to build, build our capacity to success, successfully accomplish our objectives. And then, like I said, we work with our community, our organizations, our nonprofits. <coughs> we want to develop strong and ongoing partnerships with community organizations. And then, of course, <coughs> expand and enhance the use of technology to serve our community. So like I said before, we, are, we want to be the heart of the community. We want you to feel like when you come to our programs, to our facilities, that you have hope that what you want to accomplish, you will be able to accomplish. And I am so proud and I am so delighted to work with these ladies um, to make this vision and make this come true. 
And I want to thank the Board of Commissioners. I want to thank Cabinet Minister Curtis Superman because this is a dream come true for me. And I feel like it's a dream come true for everyone in our division and our commitment and our love for our community. So at this time, I will bring up Douglas County Public Library's Director, Lynn Newman. Hi, I'm Wendy Moore, my Douglas County Public Library is um, kind of librarian. I've been with the county, um, this is my 20th year, so I'm excited to be here with you. I'll try to go quickly. Um, got a lot of information. Um, one of the one things I wanted to highlight is while parts of the county may have been closed during COVID, the libraries were only closed for two weeks. Um, after, during those two weeks, we were able to accomplish a full scale inventory of all of our items that had not been inventory since before 2000. So we were really glad that we had the opportunity to do the full inventory, but yes, we were only closed for two weeks. After that, those two weeks, we um, started with our curbside services and patrons were able to um, place holds or give us a call. We would pull all of their items. We would even, if they sent us documents, we would print them and bring them to their cars. We still have those services and that was one of the Interesting things, I mean, unanticipated <laughs> challenge, but we were able to turn that into a permanent service now. So we all we will, for now on, have curbside services. Um, we have lots of patrons that really enjoy our curbside pickups. Um, in addition, um, we received some grants, some ARPA money um, through the West Georgia Regional Library Services um, to inc expand our e material resources. We now have over access to over one million movies and music files. In addition to our ebooks, so through Canopy and Hoopla, which are our new services, um, you don't have to pay for that movie. Just download it from the library. Don't don't buy the new CD. We've got it for free. So um, that's in addition to our ebooks and e audio books. So we're excited about that. Um, another thing that we um, we've expanded our programming offerings. We um, in addition to curbside, we have our remote reference. So you don't have to come into the library to talk with our reference librarian. You can email her, you can um, text with her, and we can get you um, all the services that you need. Um, social media, we've really um, increased our national and international exposure through social media. And um, one of our challenges has been staff retention. Um, we have lost seven employees this year. We've been able to um, hire back six. Um, our last one is, um, we're, we just can't get the good applicants. Um, 25 of our 36 employees are paid on less than $15 an hour, and our part-time positions are at $11 an hour. So that's really hard to get um, a quality applicant at $11 an hour. Um, this is a comparative over t from 2020 to 2022. Um, circulation has increased 12%. Wi-Fi usage has increased 34%. Computer usage has increased 28% and interlibrary loans, that's books coming from other libraries to our library for our patrons, as well as us sending books out to other libraries, and that has increased three and a half percent. So uh, we're really excited to see the Wi-Fi usage increase. Um, we are continuing to um, increase our broadband speed, and we now have Wi-Fi available in the parking lots. So even if you can't come to the library when we're open, our Wi-Fi is available in the parking lots 24-7. <coughs> We have big goals for 2022. Um, the projects we're currently working on, we're working with the Douglas County Schools to institute a play card where you don't have to, a lot of problems we have with um, children can't get their parents into the libraries to apply for their library card. Well, we're working with the school system to institute the program where all they have to have is their student ID number and they can um, check out books without having to have the parent with them to fill out the application. Um, Carrollton City has already instituted it, several other places in the state have already instituted it, so we're hoping that to get that rolling um, January. Um, we're also, through some ARPA funding through the region, we are able to um, start back our Wi-Fi hotspot and laptop checkout program. That was really popular a few years ago, and then it kind of went kaput, so we are getting we should be getting over a hundred um, hotspots so that will um, really be popular um, we're replace outdated technology updating our security cameras those are part of our patsies um, and let's see we're also seeking grant funding for the um, Selman library renovation um, most of our employees are younger than the library 
it's in the building, so we're, we're really hoping to get that renovated. Um, establish a STEAM um, lab at Dog River, establish some story walks um, at Dog River, Boundary Waters in here. Um, create a career center at Salmon Drive. We are working on a community garden at Libby Springs. We want the Chapel Hill Library. Woo -woo. And um, we re finished replacing the floor at Lithia Springs. So those are our goals for 2022. Um, let's see, and that is our potential budget and our taxes. And that's us. Thank you, Sarah. to stand before you and talk everything to your services. Um, I cannot do it in five minutes, but I'm going to have to. So I can go on and on and on about senior services. So I have um, some notes here for you. And here we go. So um, as you're aware, the very nature of our job actually requires us to be hands-on and extremely involved in the daily lives of those we serve. So, in 2020 and 2021, we know what happened, COVID. And that was definitely an unexpected challenge because it meant keeping your distances and staying six feet apart. Senior services, that's unheard of. Um, in fact, that's the total opposite of what we do. We hug, we transport, we prepare and deliver meals, we do light housekeeping, we dance, we sing, and we have birthday parties. So, we know that that was a struggle for us. Although initially a challenge, we had to find ways to conquer it. We had to do something and we had to do it quickly. So, you see, those we serve, they often live alone, they're isolated, and some days we're the only smiling faces that they see. So in, in essence, we became a senior center without walls. We formed lucrative partnerships with, um, that afforded us the opportunity to have ice cream socials and dance parties outdoors with the Sheriff's Department. We hosted virtual health and nutrition webinars with the UGA Extension programs. We played parking lot bingo with Kaiser Permanente and um, local churches allowed us to utilize their parking lot. But I think one of the most lucrative partnerships was that with Cobb and Davis <coughs> That afforded us the opportunity to actually host life-saving vaccination clinics. So she already said I'm at three minutes. Life-saving <laughs> vaccination clinics. But um, then the other challenge, staff. We had issues where staff did not want to receive the vaccine. They questioned the vaccine, and so we met, we educated our staff. We talked about the benefits and how we were able to move back into the homes and to help our seniors. And so we did, we overcame that challenge. And then our other challenge, raccoons. Yes, <laughs> raccoons. We were in an apartment, and that's a real raccoon on the shelf in one of our offices. Yes, and so <laughs> that came from buildings. We had um, that, <laughs> an old, old building. Um, yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Saturday Road, but thanks to VLC, they gave us funding to get um, our, have our roof repaired on Faber Road. We were able to do upgrades in the garden at Woody Five, and then we opened this center here. Um, Lithia Springs Senior Center, which increased our visibility. And some of our accomplishments that I am so, so proud of, we um, received a grant to do a homeless initiative to actually go out into the community and to provide meals to homeless seniors. We have a lot of seniors who are homeless. That was a $20,000 grant. We partnered with local food trucks, and we did that every week. Every week, week after, after week. We also received CARES Act funding, FFCRA funding, and with that, we were able to actually provide meals to individuals who are on our wait list. We were also able to purchase air conditioners, refrigerators, um, um, 
just anything that they may need, wheelchairs, anything that a senior may need, we use those funds. And then the My Senior Center, we, that was a grant that we received and we're able now to, we have one system where seniors can actually register for programs at home. They can come in the center, we can have events in the parking lot, we scan their car, bam, they're registered for their classes. And then the one I think that I am just so elated about, we received a $750,000 CDBG grant to help keep the raccoons out. So <laughs> we <laughs> will be doing that. And then our comparative analysis for 2020 and 2021. As you know, senior services, our doors never closed. Our doors could not close. We had to keep doing what we needed to do. And so you can see that our numbers for 2020 and 2021, they align well with each other and at the point where we are right now. And then I go to 2022, we have big goals as well. We definitely want to decrease our wait list. We want to open our centers to full capacity. We want to increase community partnerships. We're also going to apply for the Thanks Mom and Dad grant, CHIP um, funding, and that will allow us to rehab seniors' homes, to go into their homes and rehab, and then more CDBG. Um, paint the interior of Woody Fight, Rehab Family Road, and initial planning for the new senior center on the west side. And as you can see, that's our proposed budget and our pad we need van cars wheelchairs i mean yeah a wheelchair lift van and for we fight and we can spring you see our numbers right there thank you
is riding on the Saturday schedule. We still are reduced services. However, once we get back into full service, we will be actually looking at the routes, seeing areas that we can service to get the ridership back up to not only 21,000, I'm looking at 50,000 because we want our routes to be community friendly. So we have to service those areas. With van pool usage, I did not have data for 2020 to date due to no services are running. However, we have those vans on our lot, so we have to utilize those vans. So those vans are gonna have to be used in other areas of the services. The voucher program is on a great track. It is still going with 55,000 as of last year and it's 40,000 as 4,000 as of this year. My goal is to recruit and develop our staff. We are shorthanded. However, we are productive shorthanded staff. Though we're limited in staff, we're still getting the job done. Everyone's showing up, everyone's being productive. When we recruit staff, when we develop staff, I want my entire staff to be cross-trained. If Serena's not there, I need my next partner to know what Serena was doing, how she was doing, and how it's gonna get done. The van pool research usage without, within regulations, uh, on-demand service would be good. Dedicated drivers versus volunteer drivers. We were using volunteer drivers. Will we need dedicated drivers to utilize those vans? Reestablish some routes for the business needs. And we have to put a start date out there for van pool. Fixed route and paratransit, revisiting the routes as I stated, the ridership, and my goal is to have benches and shelters put in place by quarter two. And when I say four, it's two and two. I'm looking to have two benches and two shelters in place. That is the budget, this is five, and the Patsy. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I think we have the best team. hearts and flowers and cheers. Um, I'm Jennifer King with Juvenile Programs. Been um, involved here for 26 years. I'm very happy to say that. Um, for Juvenile Programs, you know, we're a little different. We're kind of tied in with the court system, so our the things we do are, are just so way different from what I hear everybody talking about. Um, some accomplishments and challenges for us. Um, Recently, we have applied for another federal grant to fund a juvenile mental health accountability court. We haven't heard yet on that grant any day now. We're super excited and we actually have staff in place within the office to begin the program without the funding. Um, so we wanna move forward and, and put some focus onto the mental health of our children and youth that we're serving. Um, we did implement a brand new evidence-based therapeutic true diversion program for our kids. So when we're diverting them from court, we put them in with a therapist group um, who work on life skills and behavior change. Um, so we're really excited about that too. Um, we're on track, hopefully, to serve about 600 families this year in all the ways that my office serves families. Um, we're at 225 with community-based service referrals. Those are kids that are not coming into our court system, um, which is a huge accomplishment. And then right now we're at about 35 with that true diversion program. Our second graduation will be happening, I think, next Friday. Um, our family treatment court, accountability court, added 12 new people this year, which is really, really good um, considering the challenges. Um, a lot of our challenges revolve around just lack of referrals whether that's law enforcement, defects, um, the schools, the community, just because of the pandemic and everything slowing down. Um, and then some of our programs and services in the community that haven't come back in person. Uh, oh gosh. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's like that was really fast. <laughs> um, you know, we, we've met all the requirements for the grants that we manage. We're right at about nine, a little over $900,000 in grant management right now. And as some of you are aware, I have Jill Hansen, who is top notch on managing our grants. Um, I definitely couldn't do it without her. 
So for 2020 and 21, um, you know, we, we com came up with a hybrid. <laughs> we were home, some were in the office because the population we work with, they need that constant contact. They need to see your face. They need to see your reactions. Um, so we, we quickly put into place um, phone and video contact with, with our kids, with our parents we work with, um, you know, to maintain all of that. We completed many, many trainings and webinars that were available during the time that we were teleworking um, and, and really did pretty well, considering, I think. Uh, we, we had a kind of a lull for a minute and then it started to pick right back up. Um, we returned back to the office in full in early 2021, uh, brought in face-to-face -face as soon as we could under all the guidelines. Um, and again, we're looking to serve a lot of families before the end of the year. For our goals, you know, the top part is just kind of those standard goals that, that, that we have in our department every year. And we came up with some specific objectives this time. Um, I really want to work on the data reporting that we have and how to share that. Um, a lot of times it, it stays within us, and, and I, I might can tell you, or, or somebody in my office might can tell you, but I want to be able to share that with this group, with the community, put it on the website, whatever it is that we can do to be able to share that easily. Um, still working on an approach for the, the citizen feedback on the website. We were going with it and then the pandemic hit. Um, still looking for that within the office. I want to know, you know, how my staff is working with these families. Because there's a lot of, you know, tense situations that we deal with. Families are not in the best frame of mind when they see us. And, and for my staff, I want us to meet them where they are. You know, if we have to sit on the floor with a kid or a mom that's, that's you know, devastated, then we're going to do that. Um, unfortunately, Tiffany was there this week where a mom left her child in our office, left the courthouse, just said, I'm done, y'all can have it. Um, it's also very stressful at times, you know, to get someone to come and take care of that because we, we can't be responsible for a child in the courthouse, just like none of you would want to take that either. Um, Continue to pursue training for all the areas we're involved in. Trauma is a big one, mental health, all of those. Um, start that chance court, which is the mental health court, and then just continue with our community relationships with all the providers and resources. I need contact information for your dance person. I was watching her yesterday thinking that might be a good thing for us. Um, and then that's us. We're, we're pretty normal, nothing crazy in the budget. So. coming up too. I was very proud of Jennifer and her staff. I was in the office when that happened and how they handled it. And it really gave me some insight on how the, the compassion and the care. And I know I keep saying that, but I, I mean, I, I just want to hats off to you and Jill Hobbs and everyone that was in there in that moment because I was shocked. And I, you know, but professionalism and, and compassion and caring. Thank you. Okay, so we are here for questions. All right, thank you so much, Jill. Wow, excellent. Give yourself a hand. Before I yield the mic to um, my fellow board commissioners, certainly wanted to, uh, I heard customer service, customer satisfaction, and that your model is built around customer service. Is there, uh, what are the plans for the future customer service uh, satisfaction survey tool, maybe on our system, and I know Fred and I, uh, certainly his team, uh, before he became deputy uh, county administrator, focused on customer service and customer satisfaction. So, are there plans for a tool? And it may be a broader question for our county administrator to make sure that our customers can respond to us and provide us with data. Yes, so one of the things, like I said, we've only been in the division for two months, and that's one of the things that the team and I have started talking about. We will um, be working with the county administrator, the deputy county administrator, to look at ways to um, incorporate customer service feedback. In my mission statement, you saw provide, um, responding to feedback. That's very important when you deal with the community like these departments, do, they do on an everyday basis. So we will be looking to do that, but I would like to do it in a broader sense with the county administrator and then maybe make it more specific for our division. Okay, thank you so much. What questions, or do you have any questions or not? 
Commissioner Garvey. Yes, I've just got about three questions here. Uh, Tiffany, how many vouchers do we give away? Uh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> the director. <laughs> That's okay. Today we've done 4,053. I mean, on an annual basis, is on it 100? Um, on an annual basis, you do roughly 192, 120. Okay, all right, and um, on, Regarding the on-demand bus service, yeah. um, what are the plans uh, when it when's the ETA of it? <laughs> of we're, the we're actually researching as we speak. We're researching different areas to utilize the van pools, advance for that service, and we have to really look at the financial part of it. How we can use the vans within regulations so they were bought with federal funds. And once we do that, we will know actually at the start date, but we have to do the research before we can give a date out to the public or anyone else. Okay. Uh, I know uh, Carroll County does have that, and uh, you, maybe you can talk with them. But um, one other question, there was a lot of technology money in here. I'm on the te technology committee, and we were presented a list. So is the director of benefits in here uh, the other day? Uh, that we're going to be recommending, um, you know, the funding for. Uh, was that included on that list? All yes. these technology. Yes, we we um, we um, aggregated everybody's technology list <coughs> of every department, and it's on the on the full list that uh, was shared at the technology committee. Okay, uh, so the. The budget is uh, applied to his, not his department, but to the individual <coughs> departments, right? It's actually ARPA funding, so it's, at, it's not living inside of any individual budget. It'll be accounted for separately. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying there's technology line item in each of these budgets and, and a lot of the budgets. Anything that's new technology <coughs> would be on the ARPA list. But if, if they, for example, have an existing software and they need a... Um, a renewal that would be embedded in their depart in their budget. If you see something on technology on the Patsy, that would have ended up on the <coughs> combined technology list. Okay, because I thought I saw something about technology replacement and upgrade here in the library. It's on the ARPA list. It's on the ARPA list. Mm -hmm. So it needs to come up. Okay. We just right. we just laid everything that the departments requested. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure we weren't doing. <coughs> All right. I think I talked to I didn't I haven't talked to you. I think I talked to you before Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. all, all right. Well thank you all so much for listening to us. Thank you for working for me. Before the time start, I like for the uh, directors. Tell me who the best boss in the world is. <laughs> and now, I'm asking the best boss in the world is, who hurt you? Talk much in front of people. So. <laughs> I'm trying to proceed. Uh, first of all, it's all about the community, and uh, I like to ask uh, E911 to come up to be ready, and also EMA. We are working together as a team, and uh, we're going to follow each other. The first slide is about um, it's about having fun and taking care of the community. Our internal stakeholders as well as our external stakeholders. So. This is a picture of us uh, having fun, uh, working with a campaign out in Texas. We enjoyed it, but most importantly, we got a chance to engage the community. They donated teddy bears, and we, we did that program. Okay, our accomplishments and unanticipated challenges. As everybody knows, COVID hit, uh, and also we had another surge of COVID that came in, but. Our main accomplishments was to uh, restructure the organization. Uh, we did that by 
strengthening our uh, command staff, as well as uh, uh, strengthening our uh, existing staff. Uh, we improved. We improved accountability. Uh, as I said earlier, we had Teddy Bear for Texas campaign. Uh, we received a 1.2 million dollar grant. Uh, assistant firefighter. We improved our response equipment and also station nine and station four uh, RFQs. And uh, those stations, but well, station four was in need of uh, of uh, some improvements. And we just thank the board and uh, this doesn't allow us to be uh, able to get the ball moving. Uh, challenges, uptick in COVID-19 cases, EMS shortage, a nation, nationwide shortage, uh, increasing overtime, increasing big repair costs, uh, difficult acquiring parts, and vehicles due to chip shortage, uh, increasing our call volume. Um, going back to this, this uh, first slide is uh, what we're doing is our entire organization is thankful to our board of commissioners for uh, believing in us and us to do our jobs. We just want to thank you. Skipping forward to our uh, comparative analysis. Uh, in 2020, we had an issue with our ISO training uh, due to the call volume being up, uh, running calls back to back to back. Some of our ISO training and, and start to have an issue. Checking hydrants, uh, training, uh, pre-fire plans, that kind of thing. Uh, so in 2020, we improved the ISO training by 100%. I mean, we hit it hard. We're doing the calls, but we're also doing the training as well. Uh, reduction in firefighter state certifications. We, we found 37 firefighters that didn't have the certification. In 2020, we had 100% compliance. So that was a big deal for us. Uh, reduction in community engagement. Due to the pandemic, everybody home, uh, as as, as uh, he said, was cleaning out their storage rooms and basements and everything. They we, we we really couldn't get out in the community much. So right now we have increased that community engagement, and it's working really well. Uh, like of executive staff, like I said, we hired three deputy fire chiefs, and they're doing extremely well. Low employee morale, but due to the uh, changing conditions, BLC raises and stuff like that, morale has really picked up, and everybody's really excited about that. Our goals for 2022, uh, one is to improve firefighter safety. We're gonna do that by bringing back the field schools, MPQ, continuing two field schools. We have it in our budget. Uh, hopefully get approved for that. Uh, improve our PPE for our firefighters. And we're gonna try to apply for, not gonna try, we're gonna apply for more AFG grants so that can relieve our, our budget as well. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a few days ago, Ms. Stewart sent me some information on AFG grant. We're gonna apply for that grant. Purchase new response equipment. Uh, we're looking at RFP for two fire engines, RFP for three ambulances, and also we have appeals. Thank Ms. Don Evers and the Board of Commissioners and County Administrator for four quick response vehicles. Those vehicles will help us with our response and get to our patients so we can we can apply our uh, skills, EMS skills. Community engagement is a big piece for us for 2022 for our goals. We're going to increase our community visibility. Uh, we're going, to, we're going to do community risk reduction programs. We're going to build community equity. And I have pledged to lose 10 pounds. <laughs> it's going to help us out. We'll further do this. Uh, budget slide goes here. Um, there was a few technical glitches, as usual. But, uh, well, no, we can state that your budget is around $17.1 million. Okay. Your revenue sources is your ambulance fee, and yes, then also um, the transfer ins and out from general fund and the other city. Awesome. Fund your budget. Um, budget. Now, right. one thing we're doing about our ambulance fees is we are doing a laser focus, make sure that we are getting everything we can get for our accounting piece, and um, we're, we're able to save several thousand dollars by making sure that things are the, the front reports are signed properly and we have to process. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our 911, Ms. Tina. All right, uh, my name is Tina Donnell, and I've been with 911 for 32 years. And I was not expecting to be here with y'all, and I'm so grateful that I am, and I appreciate y'all and everything that y'all done for us this year and the guidance that we've received from the chief. 
and the new structure has uh, been very beneficial for our department. All right, for this year, um, for 2021, we began working on our backup 911 center. We put a lot of work and effort into bringing our old center up to become our new backup center. If ever an occasion arose that we would need to leave on an urgent basis from the current center. We be began building our new CAD. We're moving to a new CAD system. It's the same uh, CAD system that the Sheriff's Office Dispatch uses. And we are currently building all the underlying run cards and mapping systems for it. And that's what we've been working on all year. We have uh, created, because of COVID, uh, created a satellite dispatch location to utilize during a required isolation of employees where they've been exposed but don't have symptoms or they've had a direct family member that was exposed just to try to keep everything down to a minimum in our department. <clears throat> and the lingering of COVID-19, because when we uh, all heard about it, we all anticipated it coming and going and it's still here with us. <laughs> The school to remain virtual was a huge impact on our staff and um, led to quite a few of our employees uh, resigning because they were not able to work out solutions for them. And that was uh, the staffing shortages. We ended up losing about 10 of our eight, eight being fully trained dispatchers in our center and then two trainees um, our comparative analysis of actually are not very different. We implemented several measures in 2020 that we are continuing. Uh, the sanitization protocols for our building and our consoles because we are back to back 24 hours a day at the same position constantly. We did rework staffing to compensate for isolations due to COVID. We're all used to working in the same room together and now we have occasion that someone will be working in a completely separate location and still need to be able to communicate with the others on duty at the same, at the same time. Uh, multiple first party exposures and dependents with exposures impacted our scheduling and um, made us get really creative with, ha with having enough people on duty at all times. Implemented health checks for incoming staff um, very early and we actually still do all of those we haven't made any changes, so we're still continuing with those. Thank you. All right, so our goals for 2022, we plan to bring our new CAD system online. Our target timeline at this time is February 2022. We are um, going to improve our staffing levels by hiring new employees. We have already brought in two new employees and our plan is to bring on two more before the end of the year and we are planning to retain our current employees by implementing pay raises. Thank you so much. Well, let, me, let me say 911 is really doing a wonderful job. Uh, I've sat there, uh, I've showed up at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and, and they've looking over the shoulder saying, is that the chief coming in? They are really doing a good job, and uh, this said that the county is safer because of them, and they are doing a wonderful job. That's why she's here uh, representing. Thank you. I'm Jason Nolan, the EMA um, director for Douglas County, and well, emergency management basically focuses on four areas. We coordinate emergency response, we coordinate um, planning and preparedness, mitigation, and, um, and recovery. So we're, we're a big uh, department. I have a staff of one um, full-time secretary and one part-time person that, um, that was, well, they let me hire last year. So, but uh, the, so we're involved in a lot. Of, I think some of you got to see during the last two years um, um, some of the things we got involved with you with you, the, the different aspects of trying to manage the what was going on and our accomplishments uh, this year the a big deal is the FEMA uh, approval of our hazard mitigation plan that plan took about two years to write and going back and forth with them this year to get the final approval on it that's a lot of 
it, it sounds simple, but that, that's, uh, that's a big deal. And it uh, also allows us to get mitigation grants without that. It cuts off funding, federal funding for multiple um, um, mitigation grants. Things like that. Um, we also were able to get reimbursement of around a little over $69,000 for Tropical Storm Zeta that affected us. And we just turned that check over to finance. So that was a, uh, you know, that was, you know Luckily, normally we would never not get that uh, that amount that low. Usually, we would need to be around five hundred thousand dollars in damages to get recovery. But the governor, way the governor and the, uh, the president declared that um, that disaster included every county in the state. So we were able to get a little. Um, that's that's seventy thousand, almost seventy thousand dollars. We would not have for that um, without the work and everything went into that. It's a lot of documentation, and uh, GMA did approve our each year. You know, the state you work uh, works. Um, on a different cycle than we do. They do mid-year, you know, in a July and a July through June years. And each year, I have to do an agreement, and basically, we're, 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 they have goals for me to meet. And I, as long as I get those, we get a little bit of money on um, the grant each year. So they approved our work plan, which is always good. And the increased partnership, um, uh, in, in continuing to work with Pop Cobb Douglas Park helped, and you know, you know, in twenty and and twenty, um, twenty, we were kind of working on the. Uh, Testing, testing, we have testing, 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 and then we transition to our vaccine, finding locations and making sure they have what they need, especially for our, our staff. That was, everybody wanted back, remember back in January, it was, everybody, everybody wanted that back, um, vaccination, uh, the people that wanted it, want, they wanted it now, and trying to get that kind of working out. And some of the challenges that this year, the Delta variant, it, it, I mean, it really took the wind out of myself. I thought we were getting, we were, um, we were, uh, we were getting over the hump, and that hit and knocked us back down a little bit in, in our fight against COVID. So that was a, a, unexpected. I needed to be spikes, but that was a little bit much. Uh, the personnel changes throughout the county, the state. I'm, 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 I have to, I have to use other people because of my big staff. I have to work with other, every department, no department heads, and know where I can get things done. And the change of staff when, you, when things go wrong or you need help real quick, you got to know those people. You got to be able to get in there. So that's, that's a huge challenge, and, uh, and uh, re, um, just uh, changes at the division. <laughs> and FEMA's changed the requirements. And they, they've uploaded the work, uh, ship a lot of work from the state to us. So the, the workload we're having, the ambulance we have on federal um, FEMA grants and and procedures, it, it's it's tripled the work. On that. It, it's un, it's unreal. I, yeah, I know it's helped a little bit, but it's it's, it's killed me. Uh, I'm sorry, our, our goals are, uh, I'm sorry, fair analysis. Um, you, um, in 2020, that's all we did was COVID. I mean, seriously, that's all basically we, we were not even doing anything else. In 2021, we opened up the EOC back for meetings and classes. We're doing tabletop exercise again, and uh, coordination uh, transitioned from the vaccination. Uh, our goals for the up to 2022, we want to increase our um, CERP membership by one by having a re uh, our CERP program is a community emergency response team where we use citizens as volunteers in emergencies and teach them preparedness goals. We want to get some more uh, people involved with that and bring back the people that, would, that we that, that feel uh, basically feel neglected. They, they went through the training and everything, we've not been able to use them as much as we'd like to. We want to bring them back and engage them. Appreciate some of the work they've done before and bring them back up to speed. So that's, that's going to be an important goal for us to um, do that. And, um, and we want to reach out to what we have uh, what's called National Incident Management Training. We want to um, increase some um, compliance on that, get some more people involved with uh, the FEMA training. And our, we want to get back more out public. I, I miss getting out public Boy Scout groups and different groups in the evenings. So I, I, I said go so I know how many I get. I do better on goals like this where I know I need to be, I got this many more to do, I need to get them in there. So that's kind of, and the same thing with the, um, bring some more FEMA, GEMA emergency management courses for the county into the, to the fold. And that rounds up. Yesterday during the uh, Board of Commission meeting between 8.30 and 12.30, what were you doing yesterday? We, we were doing the uh, takeoff exercise for a natural gas um, situation that involved two, two gas companies, all the law enforcement in the county, including the school police and fire and EMS, 
and um, so just coordinating how we do that and, and, and discuss the problems and difficulties so everybody kind of understood this. I thought it was important. So everybody knew what everybody would be doing during that event. So how the delays were going on and stuff like that where people had full understanding. I thought it went very well. What an amazing county. While our county leaders are taking care of business, we're taking care of business, keeping us safe. Let's give them another hand. We have questions. No questions for me. No. <laughs> Board of Commissioners for our dynamic team. I'll ask um, in regards to training and hiring new um, E911 operators, what, and you said um, increased pay. Yes. Talk to me about that. Uh, we are uh, increasing the pay for our staff, um, and that will make us more comfortable with the agencies around us. We have, in the last several years, become a training ground. We train them, it takes us about a year, and then they go to Cobb County, or Fulton County, or Atlanta 911, or the railroad is very popular with their dispatch center. So we are, uh, we have submitted a proposal to become more comfortable with Metro Atlanta okay. to keep our folks here. So training and incentivizing group pay, you believe will help you to fill those slots? Yes. Okay. And you talked about child care as being one of those things. You it's a struggle for yeah. 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it, you and I can talk offline, but maybe there's a way we can set something up through the county to kind of, you know, would love as to. an incentive to get yes. people. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. And I, I think that's it. Any other remarks? Thank you so much, Commissioner Carpenter. Any other remarks? Uh, Commissioner uh, your budget's an enterprise, so uh, is it not? It is. It's not an, under our general fund. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I understood that. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Great job. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Dukes, and I'm the director of Parks and Recreation. I'm 6'2". Yes, <laughs> and I used to be 190 pounds. Uh, Chief thinks he's got the Department of Fun. Where'd you go? He thinks he's got the Department of Fun. Well, we're the Department of Fun, right? Parks and Recreation. Uh, first of all, some of the accomplishments we uh, had in I'm gonna try to speed this up and get us back on the time because I know we're we're behind uh, some of the accomplishments we had uh, and unanticipated challenges in uh, 2021 uh, we completed four spot splash projects this year we had the Bill R fair play concession stands open up we had our tremendous opening tremendous opening of our Boundary Waters Activity Center two weeks ago. I hope most of you came and saw the building. It's magnificent. Uh, great addition. Great addition for not only the Recreation Department, but uh, the county. Um, we reorganized our Recreation Department this year uh, in January. Saved $100,000. In, uh, in uh, general fund money. And that went to replace the roof at Deer Lake. And in about a week, it'll be complete. The new roof will be on. So big need, it's been needed for years and uh, that was a big, and is a big accomplishment. We completed the trailhead at uh, Clinton Farms, uh, a central location where everybody can meet a new pavilion. If you haven't seen it, please go out and take a look at it. You might want to utilize it. A uh, beautiful pavilion for the citizens and their families. Uh, one of the challenges for that 
new trailhead was na navigating the grant. We had a $75,000 matching grant that we built the trailhead with, uh, but they threw us a curve. So we usually just deal with the state with that grant. We had to deal with the state and the feds. Everything we sent the state, we had to send the feds. So you can imagine that kind of drew the project out for a while. Pumpkin Town Park, uh, we have developed the plans for the grading for the new trailhead. We finally acquired the soil samples for the bridge that will go across Bear Creek. It'll be a magnificent bridge, by the way. Um, we are now in the process of getting those plans for the bridge, the foundation plans for the bridge, which will be rolled into a complete package, and we hope to be going out for bid soon. So uh, that's where we are with Punkett Down Park. We also did the demolition of Mount Carmel Park, an old park that was dilapidated and needed to be uh, torn down, we got that completed, and we are now in the process of doing some beautification over there. Comparative analysis to 2021, I kind of did a little different take on this uh, because we spent a lot of our time, as all of us did, dealing with COVID. But sometimes we forget some of the challenges we had dealing with COVID. Some of the challenges probably weren't challenges to you, but to me, navigating Zoom, navigating Teams, that was a challenge for me. So, uh, you know, we did the Teams thing, we did the Zoom thing, we learned all that, we learned how to communicate, we learned how to meet. Uh, we had to buy the, perfect, uh, the protective shields, the mask, the thermometers. You know, we went through the whole deal. We all did. So that was the administration aspect. But every phase of our department, we had to put together a protocol to do our program. It wasn't just the aquatic center where we had one swimmer per lane. Uh, it was athletics where we had to sanitize all of our equipment, our batting helmets, our bats, everything we did, we had to learn a new protocol for. Um, our parks maintenance crews, every amenity in the park that was utilized, some of them were sanitized three times a day. Our restrooms, our playground equipment. So the point is, our uh, we did the same services. We had the same services. We just had to learn the different protocols to get the services to the people. So that was the biggest difference in 2020 as compared to 2021. We still did programming. We still delivered the services. We just had to do it in a different method. And uh, so that was, that was the big thing. Uh, our parks maintenance crews, they mowed grass, they took care of our parks, uh, our park security, uh, they worked their regular schedules 365 days a year. So, you know, Douglas County Parks and Recreation was open in 2020 just like it is this year. So, um, we'll move on to the goals. The goals. Uh, I'd like to get Boundary Waters, the new Boundary Waters Activity Center up and programmed fully, start tournaments, uh, have special events, which we will, for every holiday. Pumpkin Town Preserve, get it completed. That's, that's my goal for this coming year. Uh, start working on the splash forecast list, getting it complete and training our new staff. We have a lot of new staff, seven alone at the, the Boundary Waters Activity Center, and five of those are managers throughout the department. So that's another goal, be training our new staff for next year. Um, our budget, 
for next year. And that's all I have, except I would like to thank the commissioners. Uh, those are our ask. We have a lot. <laughs> And, and say that number out loud. That number is three million dollars worth of ask. And those aren't wishes, things that we don't need. These are things we need. These are things that have been put off for years. So those are our ask. But the main thing, one thing I did want to say is I want to thank the commissioners for these raises that you put in place. Nothing could affect our workers in the county more than these raises that you've given for next year and the following year. We're the ones that have to stand in front of these people and ask when they ask for raises every year. And it, nothing saddens me more to be able to tell them that they're not going to get a raise. But nothing makes me happier to go to them now and tell them we're getting raises not only this year, but you're going to get some money next year. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> and with that, I'm the only one, so if you have any questions, I'm the one out front, so if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Okay, Board of Commissioners, thank you so much, Director Duke. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions? Exciting times. Thank you for everything. It's amazing. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not 6'2. I'm <laughs> <laughs> closer to 5'2, and uh, this body doesn't have athletics. I'll try to make this as uh, quick and as techy as possible. Uh, so, I've had the pleasure of being with the county for about seven months now. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and in those seven months, we accomplished, I think, a lot um, with the support of the board and the direction of the county administrator. Uh, some of those worth mentioning is our wireless infrastructure upgrade. I remember during my interview, the number one question is, we have issues with our Wi-Fi. Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, we're about 89% completed with that project. We're doing quality testing now. Um, we're on schedule to complete by the end of November. This is one of those few projects that not only affects the staff's productivity, but also the public directly. As they visit our centers and our uh, courthouse, they'll be able to have secure, fast internet um, while they visit. We also did a department restructuring, again, with the support of the board and the county administration. Um, our domain migration, that's one of the things I noticed when I came here. Um, during COVID, the federal government removed their fees to allocate .gov domains to all of the municipalities and counties. So we wanted to take advantage of that um, for the 2021 year. Um, our server room disaster protection. Um, one of the first things I noticed in the watch into the server room is that we had water sprinklers over our multi-million dollar uh, servers. Um, the building department with Mark and the county administrator and the technology committee acted very quickly and we were able to mitigate that within a couple of weeks. We have a gas suppression system now that protects the equipment from fire and from water damage. I mean, our county fiber inter interconnectivity, we continue to add all our um, fire stations, uh, senior centers, connecting back to the county so we can be a more robust uh, system. Um, comparative analysis. Um, 2020, spent most of the year just blowing laptops and work from home kits for our staff. Our team did a fantastic job, in my opinion, getting all that taken care of. The board did. Fantastic job getting that ordered quickly, um, expeditiously, and we were able to continue uh, to work during the work from home phase. Uh, we reduced our, this year we reduced our engineer, um, our user to engineer ratio from 172 users per engineer to 101, which is the default um, recommended ratio that you want to have for an organization this size. Uh, we created a department structure that supports business continuity. When I came along, there was a leadership vacuum department. Um, we were operating on a day-to-day -day basis, being reactive instead of proactive to issues. Um, we established goals and visions for the department that is aligned with the county's strategic goals. 
um, and establish a plan to upgrade all our aging infrastructure. This is one of the things that we're mostly proud of in our department. As you see on the left-hand side, we had seven souls supporting 1,200 users in the department of the county. Um, and we, the leadership came from the top down. We had no delegation. Um, we created an infrastructure team this year uh, led by Emmett Ward. And we added, we separated the responsibilities between security, uh, server systems, and networks and added redundancies on that. On the other side, we added, oh, we have a uh, help desk manager now, Mr. Elliott. Um, and we added positions there. Specifically, we added a support technician for the court systems, um, a liaison. She actually worked for courts, um, but she also had a technical degree from Georgia Tech, so that helped a lot. Um, we are looking next year to add, to replace a uh, vacant position for a technician and adding a technician for the communications department to support their equipment. Our goals for next year is to migrate our critical infrastructure to the cloud. We make large investments on our hardware infrastructure that requires power redundancy, internet redundancy, all very expensive. Migrating our new world and our GIS systems to the cloud not only makes it available um, wherever we are, but it makes them have the responsibility of security, our vendors, not us. Um, upgrade our cybersecurity prevention system. Any investment in this will pay tenfold uh, prevention is a lot cheaper than reaction when it comes to cybersecurity incidents. Uh, establish mobile workforce capabilities. We all saw during COVID how agile we need to be as an organization. We should be able to pick up our laptops and our tablets and work from anywhere um, at the same capacity as in the courthouse. Um, our creator, upgrade our failing network hardware. We have a lot of network hardware throughout the county that just is just failing. It needs to be restarted, specifically in court. <coughs> Um, and they continue to consolidate all our separate networks in the county. Right now the library doesn't tie into the, um, into the county network. Some of the senior services area doesn't tie into the network. So same thing we did with Comcast, the board approved this year, we want to continue doing next year. Um, and then this is our budget. Uh, as Madam Guider mentioned, um, this budget has been presented to the technology committee and approved. Um, this compensates every department, GIS, DOT, um, permitting, libraries, every department that has a technology need, that has a technology project, we will be managing it ourselves and keeping it all in-house. And it's in line with our uh, ARPA allocation and our and overall goals of the county. That's it. Very good. <laughs> Any questions? Well, commissioners, we have a question from the first event in the court. So, Alex, you talked about cybersecurity, and I know Matt, I don't know if he's still in here, talked about that too. Mm -hmm. Have you all gotten together? Because I know that there are some um, new regulations in regards to cybersecurity for governments in order for us to be able to get insured and, and all those types of things? Yeah, we've been working together closely on our cybersecurity policy. We want to make sure that that's as much as we can we can get it in line with what we need. Um, a lot of these new uh, vendors are requiring more stringent um, technology to be in place. And quite frankly, we're at the base level of cybersecurity as we stand right now. Um, in our budget, is um, those capabilities and those requirements from our insurance carriers okay. to be compatible with their requirements. Okay, that's good to know. All right, that's it. Good job. Thank you. Ironically, you, uh, again, I'm direct to the court, uh, attended a cybersecurity uh, seminar last week. Can you just share with the board what you experienced? Yeah, so um, a lot of counties are holding cyber events, um, specifically counties that have the, the big needs to. Um, cyber liabilities, um, and they shared steps that we can take to prevent these. I'm happy to mention that most of those steps and precautions we already take. Um, we have the top of the line stuff, spam filtering. Uh, we have those no before annoying emails that you guys get that tricks you into clicking on stuff. Um, believe it or not, that makes you more sensitive to that type of attack. 99% of cyber attacks come through email. No, no, it's really hard to steal your password, really hard to break into your firewall. So, all comes through emails, you click on something, you let them in, and it's over. 
So um, we, we did learn a lot. Thank you for sending me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I was six two. Gravity. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm James Worthington. I'm the managing director of development and planning that encompasses a number of departments, uh, including building department, engineering, occupational tax, planning and zoning, um, GIS, courthouse maintenance, and property management. So, got a, my hands in a lot of pots, um, but i really got a great team. Um, so I'm gonna just touch base on a few items of a few departments and then some of the directors of the others will, will kind of finish up. So. Okay, there we go. So starting with some uh, accomplishments. Um, engineering, they worked on community rating system. That's something we have to do every year. That's through FEMA, that's for floodplain. That, that is a program FEMA offers so that everybody can get discounted flood insurance. We work with other departments on this one as well. Green communities recertification. I know that's a, a big deal for some of you and that, that's basically showing the county's doing all we can to be a green partner. You know, a good steward for the county. So, we've completed a number of projects. Senior Center, I know a lot of these have been mentioned before. The Senior Center, this building, um, you know, the Rec Center. We've started working on a number of the other projects, parks, um, fire stations. So, we're looking forward to all those projects as well. Challenges, I know this has been a, a you know, dead horse that's been beaten to death, but the um, staff turnover, we've, we've had a number of staff turnover this last year. Some of those were uh, kind of routine retirement time. Some of them were pay. I'm expecting with, with all of the talks that are going on now that, that we're going to be in a good spot. So I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you for that. As mentioned before, that is a huge morale boost for, for staff members. Huge. Um, so I can't be uh, thankful enough for that. Um, other challenges, increased workloads, permits, inspections, and cases. It seemed like <clears throat> things were kind of uncertain last year, and when this year turned over, kind of the floodgates opened and everybody was building and, and developing. And those things, and I'll get to some numbers in a second on that. COVID, obviously, I don't, I don't need to go into that one. <laughs> um, so just a few, few highlights. Land disturbance permits were up 16%. That's basically any permit for any brand new development. You know, whether it be a warehouse, a Dollar General, a subdivision, not a single house, but big developments. Those are out, building permits are out. Uh, inspections are up significantly. As you can see there, we're, we're on par to do about 12,000 inspections this year just in the building department alone. And that's, that's what the staff are for. So they're, they're hopping all the time. So um, <clears throat> some of the goals for 2022, we're looking to streamline our technology options. And, uh, this is already in the books, but um, we're looking to kind of bring together. Right now, we've got a lot of software, and it kind of each department has their own software. We're looking to bring that in as one software. We have interviewed some software companies. Some of the things they can provide are um, a really robust customer report for the citizens. I mean, it, not only can it be a, a portal that you can get permits through and pay for permits, but just answering questions. And you know, civil. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to build or you want to remodel? Yes or no? And then it leads to another, to another, to another. So, really looking forward to getting that done. Um, implement an HVAC re revitalization program through the county. I know it's been mentioned before. We kicked the can down the road, off the road, <laughs> through the woods, and we're finally looking to get some of this kind of brought back up. I, I know some of the folks have mentioned. You know, we do have some very old facilities that, that do need some, some love, so I appreciate the uh, consideration of that. Other goals we're looking to do is complete the driver services. That would, of course, be in cooperation with uh, driver services and uh, GSFIC, which is the state of Georgia. So we'll be looking to have that completed hopefully by the end of next year. I should have approved plans by the end of this year, and then we'll start going from there. Uh, other staff and policy improvements for efficiency and customer service, synergy among departments. So I'll put this out there. If you need something, say something. You know, just let me know. Um, all of my folks are very, very willing to help. And 
That goes for you guys, that goes for other staff, you know, anybody, citizens, just let us know. Um, budget, we're part of the unincorporated fund, so I believe it's all gonna be discussed later. So, uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Director of Claiming Design, Ron Roberts. <laughs> Uh, 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 doing uh, athletics or anything like that, but I did live in Austin from 2000 to 2007. Some of y'all going used to get down, get off work down the green belt and rock climb. Hanging off the ledge really helps you for uh, local government service. Learn <laughs> 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 to trust. No. Also, the no, leg. No, don't worry, Tiffany. I got it. Okay. Oh, you guys are all kind of okay. <laughs> I don't know if y'all that. He said he's a planner. <laughs> All right, so uh, we talked, uh, we've heard from um, several different people talking about COVID. When we have uh, requirements for us to, to do these, these meetings and things, we have to follow uh, uh, certain uh, planning, zoning laws, state laws, things like that. So the Zoom thing that uh, Gary talked about, imagine trying to do that for 153 citizens. We had a one call one night. Crazy. <laughs> um, Guys, I get a lot of face time with commissioners. Obviously, um, so fortunate to be able to do the planning and zoning meeting. I've got a great team. I really do. Um, we uh, we got we, COVID didn't really slow us down. We're speaking a lot to planning and zoning, also to the occupational tax component. Um, so we we had the meetings. We've done the city byway during during COVID. We've had those those meetings. We've got one more uh, open house meeting that's coming up November 16th in the courthouse. Some of the commissioners have attended those in the past. Thank y'all for your participation. Um, and that's one of our future goals to go ahead and finish up the corridor management, which is part of that application and get that in and hopefully get 166 designated as the same by way. Yes. In those. Um, we've done a lot of work. Uh, uh, Madam Subedan um, asked us to look at the, the trail layers. We've been working with GIS assembling in parts of Red staff and we've assembling all the trail layers and everything that we have in the county, sidewalks, everything, so we can kind of get a layer and look at that, see what that is, see what opportunities are, and see how we can do some grants. Um, we, do, uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, meetings with uh, our coordination meetings in the county and with contiguous counties, seeing what they're up to, seeing where their annexations are, trying to stay ahead of that, um, trying to stay, find out when things are coming in. Um, we also do, uh, during uh, COVID, we also had a lot of materials that we got out to the businesses. As you guys know, we had to get out and let them know about um, um, grants and things that they were, that were available to those businesses and get those mailers out. Uh, Tammy Carden and Caitlin Fowler down there in Occupational Tax do a heck of a good job. Um, we also have uh, uh, Ross done some grants last year. Um, Madam Sudan also asked us to look at some, some brown code grants, working on that. Uh, if I had a pain point or uh, unanticipated challenge, it would be lawsuits, annexation, developers, who knows, <laughs> planning and zoning, it's a crazy world. Um, all right, so business license is up. Uh, uh, new business license up 52%. Renewed business license up 58%. The one account is down 49%. That means that that, that uh, Caitlin that we brought over from, from uh, that, that filled the back, that, that, that filled that position is doing a heck of a job. She's getting out there, making sure everybody gets paid, making sure the revenue is coming into the county. Special use permit can increase 40%. If you think you've been spending a lot of time in planning and zoning meetings, you yeah. have. Yeah. It's up 106% from last year. Um, Last night was an anomaly, by the way. Yeah. Everybody got home. I, I got home at eight. My wife was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> what do you to walk? <laughs> we have seven coming up um, in November. We got some UDC changes. We are really. I mean, you know, you know, Allison Duncan. You know, Phil Schaefer. You know these guys. But we're we're looking at the code. We're updating the code constantly, looking to to to, to make things better. One of the things we we talked about for our goals. Um, I've heard you, Mr. Carson, especially about the party houses and stuff. We looked at the software, um, uh, possibility of using that. Talked to uh, Madam Subinette about using that. Um, um, we've been looking at the code changes that's going to help us. We also have, uh, we wanted to wrap up, complete the 
Lithia Springs, sorry that uh, Commissioner Mitchell's not here. He's very active on that stakeholder group. And next, next year we're gonna spread the love, we'll maybe do a small area study in Westport and Winston. Um, uh, biggest thing we've got is going to be the, we have to have in order to maintain our, our local government status, we have to update our, our co uh, comprehensive land use plan by 2023. It means we'd like to put some money in the budget for next year and split it up to 2023 so we could start that process. It'd be about 15, 16 month process started in 2022 so that we can actually uh, complete that. That's a very uh, intensive effort. Some of y'all have been part of the CTP process that Miguel's been doing. Same thing, just on the land use side. Um, we also have, uh, we applied for the plan first, we didn't get it. And, uh, but I do want to make a plug. If you're going to ACCG, which you are, um, and you have the opportunity to take those classes for planning and zoning, please do so. This is called the plan first application. It's very rare that a county gets it. I'd like us to, 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 to pursue it. So when you, the classes you take count towards that. staff of seven counting me there's four day cleaners the reason we have so many day cleaners is the about 30 percent of the courthouse is not accessible by the night cleaners and uh, so they have to do a full cleaning um there we go now the right button my biggest accomplishment this year thanks to the <coughs> board of commissioners and madam chair was to repair the leak in the penthouse rotunda wall we have major water infiltration during rains a lot of you didn't see it because it happened in the middle of the night and we'd have to come out on weekends but that has been repaired still got a little roof issues but we're going to take care of that uh, next year um, we oversaw many large construction and remodeling projects there's a lot going on in the courthouse this year um, carpet paint uh, just a lot of projects everybody moving and upgrading and shuffling around um, I provided, my department provided equipment and trained other county departments on the hypochlorous disinfecting systems. Most of y'all uh, have that or are familiar with it. And we had to amp up the disinfecting schedule of the courthouse because people were returning to the courthouse and um, we're staying on top of that. The comparative analysis, last year when COVID hit, the biggest challenge was obtaining materials. This would have been locked up in a safe about a year and a half ago. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get it. And uh, trying to get masks, hand sanitizers, gloves, disinfectants, it was a, it was a challenge, but um, we were able to take care of that. Uh, this year's different. We had the supplies, we've got people coming back in the courthouse and we're having to amp up the disinfecting, um, get positive tests, we'll have to react. We've got a pretty good program now. We've got three disinfecting uh, sanitizers that y'all are familiar with and my staff stays on top of that and plus we, we do it on request. Um, sorry, <laughs> both years we had on top of the, the COVID, we were just maintaining the courthouse, keeping the lights on there. On, a lot goes on behind the scenes that you're not aware of to keep this courthouse running. And goals for next year are, got a few leaks in the front windows of the courthouse I'd like to get repaired. Upgrade to HVAC automation control. We still have 1997-1998 uh, uh, controls on that end. Uh, replace the hard contact starters on the elevators. We had a fire about a year ago in an elevator room. You might not be aware of, a lot of y'all may know that we elevator number three was down for about a month uh, because it had an outdated starter that stuck, caught the hydraulic fluid on fire. 
uh, smoked up the building by 1.30 in the morning, the fire department, we took care of it. Uh, you get a solid state starter, so that'll take care of that issue. Upgrade courtroom AV systems, uh, 1998 audiovisual um, equipment is uh, outdated. I'd uh, like to get that replaced. And four EV charging stations at the courthouse so that electric vehicles can charge at the courthouse. Uh, that's in the works now. It may happen this year. I've got to get, but I just got the uh, proposals yesterday. And I'm going to get with uh, Sharon and James and see if we can make that happen. And one other accomplishment this year that hasn't happened yet, but it will happen, is to pressure wash the courthouse, Madam Chair, if we start Monday. The contractor called and he'll be out here Monday with the lift and the equipment. And this is my proposed budget for 2022. <coughs> manager for Douglas County. Um, my department consists of myself and two other analysts. Um, their names are uh, Lisa Ireland and Andrea McIntosh. Um, I tell people they make me look good. They do a great job. I can't say enough about them too. So, that, I would, first and foremost, I would like to thank the board for approving the enterprise agreement with ESRI. Last year, that opened up the county to new opportunities using GIS technology. Some of the unanticipated challenges through that is upgrading server software, desktop software, and nothing ever goes wrong <laughs> when you're upgrading software. Um, that has been a pain, um, but we are working through it. So, um, applications that we have come up with. This is not the only one we come up with this year, but I had to scale back my presentation because I ran back really long. <laughs> so um, workforce. Workforce is a new application through Esri that we acquired that now Animal Services is using as a dispatching software. So they didn't have to go out and buy a dispatching software. This was included. So we set that up, and they've been using it for a couple months now, and I think they already got like 300 calls using that. Um, data creation. As Ron mentioned, um, we worked with them uh, getting some of the sidewalk and trails uh, data. We went out using a mobile <coughs> application and walked the trails that we did not have in the parks, and we were able to get that at end, and we're probably 98 to 99% done with all the trails in the county. Um, building footprints. I wanted to mention this, because this is some new technology. We, I wanted to mention anything that was new that we received through this enterprise agreement that we were able to do. So building footprints. A couple of years ago when we were doing um, some aerial photography, I wanted to acquire building footprints. Cost on that was $30,000, although maybe later. Now, through the new software, we're able to generate those building footprints. Um, and I'm trying to be done by the first of the year, but it's probably going to push in the next year. But we are, we are getting those. We are getting those done. Some of the growing pains with workforce, we had to learn the software, how it works, before we gave it to animal services. So those are just some of the things that are new to us. We are having to learn as well to um, move forward. Uh, just on the comparative analysis, um, map requests are up a little bit. The map request does not include people who call and say, hey, can you print out this post or anything else? We don't um, track that. But data requests are probably going to be about the same this year. Address assignments, we also handle um, addresses for the county. and. Uh, um, our website sessions are about the same. Um, goals for next year. I look forward to working with the uh, commissioners on redistricting. Um, we purchased a piece of software through Esri, which I think will make that process a whole lot easier. Um, working with the state GIO's office to revise data to, com to conform to P911 standards. Uh, 
be our address and um, streets are on. Implement partial fabric. It's a, a new way to more accurately um, edit our parcels. Miscellaneous department projects. Tiffany, your customer service surveys, we can do that. We can do that. So, <clears throat> and as everybody was talking this morning, there was projects going off in my head. So, and integration with ways. Um, we can now integrate our data with ways and ways data with our data. So, we get all that done in 2022. And it's my point. Thank you. I'm Russell Tassone with the Douglas County Code Enforcement Department and the Chief Code Enforcement Officer. I've been with the county for 18 years now. And uh, Gary, Heath, Frederick, I've got bad news for you guys. Six four two seventy. Six four two seventy. Five nine seven. He wins. He wants to call across the goal line. He gives to me. I got you. All right. So moving forward, you guys can cry about that later. <laughs> All right, so moving forward, the 2021 accomplishments and unanticipated challenges for our department, just real, real quickly, uh, we've had a 78% increase in illegal signage removals throughout the county right away, as I know that's still a small dent in what the commissioners see as they're out and about, and we're aware of that. Uh, but we have made a very uh, increased and proactive effort to get that done. We do have some increased dialogue with the homeowners associations through these subdivisions on property compliance on how they're working through their covenants along with the county ordinances. We're trying to work with that, and we're going to continue to increase that through 2022. And as you can see, we've got an increased presence in these subdivisions with some high volume complaints. There are some, uh, I don't want to call them problem subdivisions, but there's some subdivisions throughout the county we get calls on more often than not. And we have taken it upon ourselves to be a little bit proactive to go in there through just a simple use of verbal warnings. If we're citing the property and we see something three or four properties down, we haven't received any complaints on and we're just stopping by and saying hey they're doing this down there go ahead and get on that so we don't have to give you a citation with that now there has been a 25 percent de decrease in our overall investigations but honestly i think that's with last year's uh, people working from home i think there's a lot of people going back to work more over the last four or five months six months i think they're calling a lot less to be honest with you because they're back getting back into their own lives not sitting out looking at windows and down the street and actually, that's not a discouraging number. Um, that's good, really, because that means that you know, if someone sees one person doing this and down the road someone else is fixing the same problem, and that actually helps increase. They're, they're kind of being internally proactive, which is actually a good thing. Um, there was a, with the exception of myself, uh, there was a complete department staff turnover between May and September of 2021. And one officer was out on maternity leave. She found a different job. And uh, we actually have three new officers have started in 2021. So the three that left, we actually have, the three have been filled there. They're in the middle of training right now within the next two to three weeks. They're on the, they're on the field and on the road by themselves now, but they are, um, they're, they're pretty much up and running. So we're just working through the final, iron out the wrinkles on that and we're gonna be good to go. And as you can see uh, with the, the downtick in investigations, but we do have, uh, we've increased our court cases. Unfortunately, we've increased our court cases uh, through non-compliance for some of the citizens and businesses, but that, that's okay. We'll, we'll keep educating them. It's not a problem. As you can see, the landfill signage has, has increased almost uh, what, 78%, I think we said. So almost 3,000 pounds of signage. And that, again, is still a small dent in, in what's out there, but we are going to proactively get that handled better in, in 2022. In and that leads me to the goals for our department for 2022. Uh, going through the mobile home parks and subdivisions uh, throughout the county for litter zoning and parking violations. We're going to, we'd like to get it on a weekly, once a week, to try to get out there at least one day a week and just focus on removals of these illegal signs. Right now we're not at that point, but we will be at that point in 2022. 
and we're going to continue with our coordination and dialogue increase for our homeowners associations to work with them uh, again through their covenants and our county ordinances to hopefully get these subdivisions um, cleaner voluntarily uh, the coordination with public works that you see up here this is just recently in the last couple months since our department we're out in the field a lot um, we see these potholes that, that Keith was talking about, some of these site distance hazards up and along the right of ways and the, the right of way overgrowth. So our officers are going to be in more direct contact with public works to let them know. So we're gonna see some places that they just aren't and, and that's, that's okay. So that's, that's part of uh, what we're trying to do with this team coordination. I think it's gonna work out real well. It's worked out very well so far. It's gonna just continue to increase. And then detention ponds has, has come up on our radar in the last couple of months Detention pond violations uh, in subdivisions. Uh, our department is looking into that through our county ordinances as a way to help maintain that for the board and for the citizens in these subdivisions. I think we've got a good handle on that, and I think we're going to do just fine with that. And I believe that's it. So that's it for. The awesome team, the fun team. It's got a big comparison, and you know, everything's a competition. So, if you guys have any questions, we'll be happy to answer those. Do you have any questions for commissioners or the fun team? <laughs> yes, Russell. Uh, the signs are, uh, a, you know, it's a spear in my side, too. Right. No. <laughs> Especially the uh, handmade signs. They're not corporation signs. Right. So what are you going to do about the individuals that put out signs and never pick them back up? So as much as we can track down the phone numbers and or addresses that may be on these signs, we are citing as we as we can get addresses for the individuals or corporations, whatever it may be, they're they are receiving individual citations. If it if you give them a warning first. Uh, right, well, we actually we got to re-educate everybody. <laughs> right, no, we well we'll call them up, but it is followed with a citation with a, with a documented citation um, in case they forget three or four months down the line and think mm -hmm. we've forgotten about it. And we have other legal resources we can do as long as we've issued that citation to them. And also, you might think about like in Henry County, I believe they have a, a sign ordinance. You can put them out on the weekends, but you got to take them out back up on Sunday. Sure. So. I think about that. Thank you. Any other, thank you, Mr. Any other questions for it? All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes. Good morning. I am Vanessa Francis Castle, I'm the interim director for Animal Services. I wanted to go ahead and let you know that I've been with the county for four years. I've been in this field particularly for 26 years. Okay, so I want to start off with the challenges just to kind of give you a better picture of our accomplishments this year. So we have had staff shortages um, due to COVID and the cost of living. We did lose a numerous amount of employees. To give you an idea, on the shelter side, normally we would have 11 employees. We ran the full year with four employees. Animal control for all of the county of Georgia, or of Douglas County, we had three animal control officers running for the full year. Okay, so we were very shorthanded. This did go ahead and increase our complaint volume, but that is, you know, we're working on that. Currently, we have hired four more people on the shelter side, three more officers, so we're getting up to par. Volunteerism de decrease. 90% of our volunteers are elderly senior citizens, so we did drop a good portion of our volunteers, um, which also increased our intakes and relinquishments. A lot of people that got the COVID pet and you know needed somebody to keep them company at home, they brought them back. Um, we had a lot of people that were unfortunate, lost jobs, so we ended up taking in their animals as well. But for our accomplishments, for everything that we had to challenge for, we had to think outside the box. We created a low-cost vaccine clinic for Douglas County citizens. Um, it was a mobile unit, so everybody came to us. Um, Commissioner Carthen came with us. This also helped generate our revenue. Uh, we ran it for four hours and made $4,000. So that brought up, you know, added revenue to an already lacking uh, revenue the past year. Uh, we did a creation of the Colony Cap Project, the TNR Project. 
Due to low staff, we had to rely on the community to go ahead and help, um, and it also created accountability within the, the county. Uh, we were able to go ahead and utilize volunteers and um, citizens that wanted to go ahead and help out the shelter. Uh, this has also decreased the overhead in the shelter as well. We, uh, one of our pet projects was we wanted to become a teaching facility for vet students and interns in the veterinary field. This is gonna go ahead and provide growth within our community. Uh, it's gonna be bring more vet students, more future vets um, to our community. We also started a court diversion program. It's called the Responsible Pet Ownership Class. This class is gonna go ahead and stop burdening the court system. This is gonna go ahead and increase our revenue for the shelter, but one of our mottos is we wanna educate before we enforce. So we wanna go ahead and educate the citizens on the citations, the laws, the ordinances of Brooks County, and then we're gonna go ahead and enforce them, okay? So our comparative analysis between 2020 and 2021, uh, the easiest one to see is our revenue. Between the mobile vaccine clinics, generous donors, and all the thinking outside the box, we've raised our revenue by 51%, okay? Our services calls, again, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, animal services doesn't close. All right, so you can see the comparison with our, our uh, service calls community really hasn't increased, decreased. Um, our intakes have decreased or increased just a little bit um, just due to the world is opening up, more people are coming in, more people are dropping off pets. Our life outcomes are roughly the same as well, so we are considered no kill shelter at 90% live release rate. So we have a new motto with the shelter it's realize, innovate, support, and educate on RISE system. Um, we are going to continue to increase revenue through extensive marketing. We really want to be heavy on social media marketing. We want to work with all the community businesses to go ahead and advertise for our pets, donate to our shelter, um, expand access to low-cost vaccines and microchips through mobile efforts. This is going to go ahead and target low-income communities to start with. This is also going to go ahead and uh, target communities that have a large di uh, disabled community. Okay. Um, those in wheelchairs, those that can't drive up to the shelter, we're going to take the shelter to them, okay? This is also going to increase the revenue. This is 100% free to us, $10 to the community. There's no overhead for us. So it's all revenue coming in. Uh, facilitate productivity through innovative technology and grants. We're already working with GIS to go ahead and get a redundant systems that we've had um, that we're being charged for. We're getting rid of it. GIS does it for free. Why not use it? Okay. This is also going to go ahead and open us up for grants that will go ahead and fully pay for a lot of our innovations that we want to do. Uh, we want to encourage collaboration with community outreach programs, share a house, uh, homeless community. We also want to go ahead and work on um, domestic violence, uh, the Meals for Wheels. Those are outreach efforts that we want to go ahead that we want to go ahead and start working with. Uh, right now, you're distributing Meals on Wheels. A lot of the senior citizens have pets. Why not go ahead and add some pet food to it? Um, the pet food is all donated, so it's free. Again, there's no overhead. Uh, these are all initiatives that we're going to take for 2022. And that's really about it. And so uh, it's, it's not that it is a, a particularly slow process, it's a tedious process, 
And depending on whether you're using local funds or state funds or federal funds, would be what process, what route you take. So it takes much longer to do the bigger projects, not just because of the size. So uh, with that, in 2021, we had uh, quite a few accomplishments. And what, what I've tried to do is focus on the projects that we've done uh, and uh, program for the next year, because we have to anticipate the need to program the project. So you can see that in resurfacing, we had a little over 21 miles. Uh, striping, we did 56 miles. And then we had uh, several projects completed, and we got them listed here. And then we had uh, projects in design, a project scoping and design that was completed. These projects formed the pipeline for delivery the following year. So one of the biggest things that we have been undertaking this last year is the Comprehensive Transportation Plan update. And that has yielded a, a list of 125 projects, 125 projects that are needed to be delivered. Now, it's going to be the task of these commissioners and following commissioners to come up with the funding, figure out how to move those projects forward. It's going to be the task of engineering and transportation to program them, to try to leverage the local funds to be able to get them delivered. So in 2021, we developed the Comprehensive Transportation Plan update. It's going to be coming before the board uh, at the, not perhaps the next meeting, but the one in December. And uh, overall, things have been moving pretty well. And uh, one of the unanticipated challenges that we found was on the Chattahoochee Hills project. We have um, uh, the original estimate back in 2010 was 12 million. It is now estimated to cost because of the route and everything else over 35 million. So uh, we do not have the, the feasibility to move that project forward. We're having to take a look at how we are able to do that going forward. Uh, comparative analysis, you can see in 2020 we had in design 13 projects, in 2021 we have eight because they have moved into construction. And in construction we have nine projects in 2021. Now what we're trying to do is get other projects in the pipeline for construction in 2022. And so miles resurfaced, you can see that we have done, uh, we're doing a little bit more uh, almost twice as much this year. Uh, roads uh, striped, we're doing quite a bit more. And if you look at uh, some of the others, traffic signals, operations, and maintenance, very comparable. So in 2020 and 2021, uh, very similar activities. Uh, the one uh, that, that stands out is the traffic sign, uh, sign and signal response. We had a lot more phone calls last year, uh, in 2020 than we did uh, this year. So the goals for 2022 is uh, 24 miles of striping, uh, of resurfacing, 27 miles of striping, and we're trying to get all the projects into construction, the main one being the Lee Road widening project. Now Lee Road has a lot of tentacles. It's a very long corridor. Lee Road Phase 2 is the one that's going into construction from 92 to 820. Lee Road Extension goes from 92 to Chapel Hill. And Lee Road Phase 1, which it's the one that would have been done first, is being done uh, almost last. It's from, 90, uh, from I-20 to 78. So that project is going into design now. Uh, we also have incorporated the TIP uh, Transportation Improvement Plan program uh, projects into the mix, and those are moving forward. Uh, we have all of these projects, the SPLUS projects, eight of them, that have been on the list ever since uh, the early 2000s, I believe, many of them. Those, we're going to start the process of getting them into the design phase so that we can get them ready to move forward into right-of-way acquisition, if necessary, and into construction 
um, as funding becomes available. Now, we're going to have to anticipate that with these projects getting into construction, uh, getting into design, the funding will have to be lined up for the construction phase. That funding is not available now. Uh, in traffic operations, uh, these, this is the budget. We have anticipated that we're going to have additional activity. Therefore, we've asked for things above the base, staffing being one of them. Uh, to be able to be, uh, to get ready, uh, to be able to service all of those projects and all of those activities. And in, in administration and program delivery, we've also, here's our budget, and we have asked for uh, improvements above the base to be able to get us in position to be able to manage all of those projects. So with that, uh, are you ready for Good morning, Board of Commissioners, staff, Rick Martin, Director of Communications and Community Relations for Douglas County. DCG is the place to be. <laughs> 2021 was filled with accomplishments for my team. Grand openings, ribbon cutting, cer cutting ceremonies, to say the least, beginning with Clinton Nature Preserve, Lithia Springs Senior Center, which we're here, grand opening, as well as the Boundary Waters Activity Center. We all remember how grand that was as well. Here is honored earlier in the year. 11 year old helped rescue his family. And we also had a deputy fire chief's swearing in ceremony to introduce all to the media. What's special about communications and community relations, thanks to the Board of Commissioners, we're your mouth, ears, and sight to the public, um, and we're proud of that. And we don't take that responsibility lightly. We're also responsible in forming large events, special events, memorable events, to help produce the special place that Douglas County is, such as the September 11th, 20th anniversary, which the entire world remembers, but so does Douglas County. What a beautiful event we had. We thank you, Board of Commissioners, for supporting us in having that. We're also responsible for the September Saturday's Heroes Day Family Community Health Day. Despite COVID itself, we still made it happen. Thank you, community. I'm sorry, thank you, Commissioner Carthen, for pushing that. Sometimes we need all of you to see what we can, because with our small department, it's, it's, it's challenging. There's a lot happening in our county, and we've raised the bar in a way that we've never had before. Other accomplishments, broadcast virtual streaming. We've kept government open so they could see what we've been doing despite COVID. Covering 50, uh, an average of 50 Board of Commissioner meetings, an average of 74 committee meetings, and also, as we have Ms. Lisa Crossman here, as well, monthly COVID-19 updates with Dr. Janet Meemark. So we are transparent and active. I'm gonna blow through this comparative analysis, but it's important. I've showed you what you have apparently seen, but here's some information you haven't seen. Communications, community relations, we have a switchboard operator that a lot of people don't know with Melanie Stenson, customer service associate at front desk, also helps answer phones, Carol Ann Hodges. In August of last year, that month, we collected 276 calls. Then in September, it increased to 776. In October to last year, 1,425 calls. And that's obvious, not just because of COVID, but also as well as the elections. So people are picking up their phone and calling and dialing, looking for information. When it comes to this year, 2021, in August of this year, 1839. 
in terms of calls, uh, September 1,600, and again in October, just over 1,800 calls. So we do have an automated system that can respond to people, thanks to the Board of Commissioners approving that last year. In March, we appreciate that. We also have a weekly newsletter, Douglas County Happenings newsletter. In November of last year, we had 8,255 subscribers. This year, November, we have 7,752. We lost about 500. Of course, residents moved here and there. But this also gave us an opportunity to really plan as a goal for next year to have a campaign to promote, to help notify, let people know they can sign up for our Happenings newsletter. Website data analysis in March 2020 through October 2021. I want to thank the Board of Commissioners for helping us really update the website. The website last year that was approved by the BOC, we can see now in overall site traffic, nearly a million people have visited our website, 833 to be exact. Page views, people going through, more than a million, 800 people have gone through our website. Um, the average visit of people when they visit, over two minutes, 38, se 38 seconds. Actions taken, pages visited, links, 2.7. Downloads, nearly a quarter of a million, 228 to be specific. Top 20 pages on our website. I want to congratulate the Board of Commissioners to be <laughs> the top 20. You made it out of 355 pages. So, hey. <laughs> you asked to be raised as a profile, that's what we do. Raise the profile in a positive way, and that's what we are proud of. Keywords, divorce, elections are some of the keywords <laughs> as well for the past year that has been on our website in terms of data. Comparative data analysis, really quickly, I want to tell you, um, you don't see much in the early quarter of 2020, but once the website came and we promoted it and advertised it, um, you know, just under like 38,000 visits there, you know, that month. And the last quarter, as you see, it jumped in 2020, in fourth quarter, over 208,000 visits. And that's pretty much because of the elections and as well as COVID as well. As we move on, goals for 2022, broadcasting infrastructure is no secret. Right now, we're working towards completely rebuilding our broadcast television control room. And also, looking at these pictures, uh, when we had Senator Warnock visit, it really hit me at this point that we need the technology to enhance live streaming out of the field. Anybody can use your phones as well, but there is technology if we could connect to Wi-Fi to broadcast live events as such. And also operating more efficiently is another goal. Having press releases distributed in a more timely manner and enhancing public media experience for your town halls, having the opportunity of virtual enhancement, uh, virtual technology at your town halls, as well as customer service. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention about these pictures, which really uh, uh, is important to note, this touches out all the facets of our community. Douglas County, inside Douglas County, we have the city of Douglasville, city of Villarica. I mean, Communications and community relations touches everyone, all of our departments, and we don't take it lightly. Thank you. I want to thank Tiffany for having on time. Thank you. thank you, commissioners. We're running about 30 minutes behind schedule. But I think you would agree with me that this was totally worth it. I'd like to congratulate the team. You all did a phenomenal job. <laughs> I am extremely proud to work with this team. And I love the growth that I see. Um, you see interim directors popping up here. You know, they're responding to the growth and the leadership and the training that is happening behind the scenes that some of you are not even aware of. But thank you all. Um, it was a little risky doing it this way, um, but I, I'm kind of a risk taker. I, I take calculated risks, but I, I knew that you all would do a phenomenal job come through for me. 
So what we're gonna do is switch up the schedule a little bit, Madam Chair, if that's okay, and break for working lunch right now. And then during our lunch, we're gonna have Milton and Steve Balfour come up and do their presentations. Is that okay? All right, thank you. Um, 15 minutes for your break and get your lunch, and then you're gonna jump in. <laughs> All right, thank you all for, and I hope everyone has an uh, opportunity to get your lunch, and I hope you're enjoying yourself. But we're going to move the show along. I'm certainly going to be respectful of your time today, but I've had to make a slight adjustment in our presentations. I have um, our community service board director, Ray Lightford. Uh, we are under accreditation at the community service board. Uh, for our Medicaid uh, insurance and other things in this huge initiative. And I uh, received some exciting news, and he will share that with you regarding our community service board, which is for our mental health substance abuse and development uh, uh, development disabilities mm -hmm. citizens here in Douglas County. So, with no further ado, I will bring Ray Lightfoot up to the rule out of black without scheduling because we know our directors are coming back. He has to get because right now we are waiting on the debriefing. I'm so excited. You all know that I am a board of directors, a member for uh, community, but our community service board service advice chair. So definitely want us to do well with our accreditation. So Ray, with no further ado, please come forward. Mr. Ray Lightfoot, he's our chief operating officer for the CSB. Give him a hand, please. The How are you guys doing? All right. <laughs> there you go. All right. Like Madam Chair just said, uh, we're going through our accreditation process right now with uh, uh, Beacon Health Options, which is the Medicaid provider here for the state of Georgia. Um, I will share that one of the programs that we went and we're really excited about is our supported employment program, which that audit completed uh, yesterday, and we scored a 117 out of a possible 125, ranking us number one in the state of Georgia for Woo! employment services. For the state of all right, so some of the things that we've done this last fiscal year, um, we created our own site pharmacy. Um, this pharmacy has the capability of providing uh, your pharmacy needs, uh, both on site or mailing directly to your home for any citizen of Douglas County, not just those that come to the CSB. Um, we are 98.99% complete with our Veterans Village uh, Townhouse Complex. Right now I have a little punch list with a few little odds and ends that need to be done. Um, we look to have that river cutting to take place in the next couple of weeks. Um, we have created a community reentry program with the state of Georgia for um, our offenders that have been incarcerated with behavioral health issues to be able to take those guys and directly relocate them into housing and employment services without them having any sense of homelessness. We have created a early uh, intervention HIV program, um, which is up and running. We provide testing both for hep A, hep B, as well as doing the rapid fire HIV testing. Um, that program was about two weeks old. We are a new recipient of the Georgia Housing Voucher Program, which this program will just support us um, for those individuals that don't qualify for our HUD housing program. So once again, this is all the things that we're doing to try to combat homelessness here in Douglas County. We have a great new medication assisted treatment program which we're awarded close to $850,000 to be able to combat alcoholism with Vivitrol. This means for any citizen that needs these services, this medication will be 100% free to them. And then uh, lastly, we have started now our new Development of Disabilities Support and Employment Program. Now, some of the things that you all know uh, that we faced, and a lot of you all have faced as well with your organizations throughout this COVID pandemic, was number one for us was a HUD um, rental moratorium, because what we do is that we subsidize rents for those individuals that can't afford their rents, um, as well as we are the uh, signing on the leases for those who have extensive criminal records that will not pass the background check. Well, when HUD uh, decided to put the moratorium out, what they failed to do when they decided to replenish those funds, they didn't include agencies that signed the leases in their names. It was only available for the individuals who had those leases that were not being paid. So that took us into a, a deficit of about $300,000. All right, COVID-related staff turnover. Once again, you know, we have things like intensive case management. These are our case managers and our behavioral health specialists and techs that go out to the homeless camps that are in the drug-infested neighborhoods trying to get these people to turn around and come back into services, trying to get them stable. And so once again, that threat sits out there. 
And a lot of those individuals decided that they wanted to work from home and take telehealth jobs in other places. Um, once again, medical and supplies, uh, medical shortages and facility related um, shortages as far as equipment. That's one of the things that pushed our grand opening for our veterans village back. We had gotten to a point that we couldn't get shingles for a roof. You know, things like these that we took for granted are really surfacing today and it slows everything down. Um, increased technology costs. Um, we had to do a huge push to telehealth services. So we had to get smartphones for all of our staff members. We had to upgrade our infrastructure and bandwidth. We had to be able to find um, terminals to, for individuals to come in and talk directly with our providers who had uh, angst and were fearful of being face to face. So all these things happened. Um, and then once again, increased staffing costs, sign on bonuses, things of that nature, hazard pay all of those things that we didn't perceive being an issue when we initially started out. So what that did for us, um, year over year, starting off with that COVID, I just have to remind you guys, our fiscal year is July 1 through June 30th every year. So when you look at that, uh, for our FY21, we had a shortfall of about 698,000. Um, coming into this year, about a million and 96,000. Uh, um, that we dealt with, which is a favorable variance of 36.3%. Uh, now, what it is, don't panic or anything like that. This is how we forecast, how we adjust, and how we shift revenues. So we know there are some losses that are built in. But I will remind you, uh, by state legislation, we're supposed to have a zero budget. We can't carry over any revenue into the next year. Everything that we do has to go directly to a new program or to a new service. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so goals for 2022. Um, we want to first uh, expand our mental health services by being able to have a at least a 18 to 24 hour operation Monday through Friday and extending weekend services. Um, we want to go in and we want to develop a peer support program, which will be for our individuals that are suffering from addiction, basically a safe haven. So at any time in high usage hours, like Friday night, they can actually come into a center have a coach or a mentor that are talking through, working through, and kind of keep them from actually going out and using again. Um, and we're actually actively looking for new SAMHSA grants. Um, and we are now working on the process to um, be approved as a satellite VA clinic as well. Wow. I know I'm fast, guys. Like I said, I gotta go back and get my letter of the law score. Uh, <laughs> but if there are any questions, that concludes my brief. Thank you guys, have a blessed day. <laughs> 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 Milton, you're up. I mean, Steve. And then Milton. Good afternoon. Commissioners, good afternoon all. I'm Steve Balfour, Chief Appraiser, Douglas County. I think I have the most caring department in Douglas County. I've listened to all the directors saying they're caring and caring and caring. This department um, is the most caring. It takes cash to care. <laughs> and uh, no budget can be funded without revenue. And this department is responsible for most of the revenue. Um, this is um, just an overview of the growth in the digest over the years from 2012 to 2021. And we can see a uh, point of note that um, even though we had COVID, uh, COVID and um, 2020, there was still growth for 2021. So that's, that's saying that Douglas is growing. Uh, in terms of accomplishments, um, I've been here less than a year, but what I've seen is that um, there's greater 
efficiency and morale within the departments in the tax assessors department we successfully completed the 2021 digest with department of revenues approval the challenges are um, continued effects of COVID-19 and uh, my biggest challenge is securing qualified staff. The appraisal department um, is, uh, contains specialized staff. They're trained um, and certified by the Department of Revenue. And um, at this point in time, they are short. Cobb County is looking for appraisers. Coral County is looking for appraisers. Gwinnett County is looking for appraisers and they have all, and myself, and they have all advertised. So it's very competitive out there. So um, I, thanks to the Board of Commissioners, we have done what we can to, um, in terms of salary increases. So we are a little bit more competitive with our counterparts, but um, there is still a ways to go, but we are getting there. Uh, comparative analysis 2020 versus 2021 I um, took a few of the core areas residential commercial industrial agricultural personal property and the overall um, numbers it's um, clear that um, residential has been consistent and we are showing a 4.9% growth from 2020 to 2021 Commercial properties uh, showed 8.49. Industrial properties, um, we need to look at that. Commissioners, industrial properties grew by 16.63%, which is very big. And um, it's saying that our warehouses and our industrial market is somewhere to focus. And um, the other interesting statistic is personal property. Um, it declined. We're showing a 6.7% decline, which is um, expected as a result of COVID. So going forward, we're looking for, um, for growth in all areas. And that's my objective. Uh, we can leverage technology. We want to be more taxpayer focused. <coughs> And uh, those are some of my goals, implementing the new software, implementing um, Tyler Technologies software so um, we can care more. Uh, the tax commissioner and myself will be on the same um, soft state database. We'll have the same database. We'll be using the same application. So we will have less um, differences with numbers. Um, I will be restructuring the, the, um, the tax assessors department to include a, a deputy chief appraiser. Um, we are uh, aiming for in, in, increased efficiency in both commercial and personal properties. Um, commercial department, um, we're looking at that right now. And personal properties, we will need to look at it because there is room for improvement. Grow the digest, I want to continue to grow the digest and create a tax assessor's department that is equipped to accommodate this growth while being taxpayer focused. And to establish fair and uniform values equalized across Douglas County so all taxpayers will pay their fair share. And that's basically it for me. Um, my budget, um, there was some overlap, so we will look at the numbers um, once it's ratified. That's it from me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? No questions. I'm fed now, not you. No, I just have a general question. <laughs> Good afternoon. Just a real quick question. Thank you for, again, what you you and everybody else does um, for the county and helping um, 
deliver services, no matter what side of the leg you fall on. Um, specifically, I just want to go back to one part about your the, the digest and um, the portfolio, um, the, the distribution across the asset classes, and you mentioned the industrial. Can you go back to that slide real quick? Or do you not go back to it? Sure. Yeah, help go back. Uh, it's a new slide that skewed up for um, elections. So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll keep going, it's okay. Just for the point of the conversation, because again, um, it's all about the revenue. You gotta follow the money. You gotta know where the, the sources of money are coming in from. So my, my silence was to listen. And I need mean, an aggregate view of sort of, let me listen to what they really talk about. Let me match the revenue. Break down. Yeah, thank you. Let me match the revenue against like, okay. All right, so go, go to your industrial, and you said to me, what, 16%? That was my notice. That's correct. All right, 16%. And the concern is that we're getting, what, too concentrated in that area? I am not concerned about, uh, it's great. I, I love it. Uh -huh. I'm not concerned. But I, I anticipate further growth. So I'm saying, um, let's build warehouses. Let's do what we, we can to make the digest grow. Interesting. I have a, a different perspective. Um, <laughs> only because of, of my district, which tends to be um, to the east, and it's about built out. And that's all they're doing is putting up warehouses. It's almost like when we first started, we were only putting, when I first moved out here, all we they were putting up with these gas stations. Gas station, gas station. That's pretty much was a, a city mindset. It clicks cash, right? Um, you, you, um, Chris Pumphrey is here. He know when he first came on board. You know, I got tired of looking at these, a lot of trucks. Like, okay, can we change this segment? Can we change this segment? That's when they came up with their six uh, strategic focuses, and one of them happened to be, you know, sort of this whole technology, repurposing the warehouses. So with that being said, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, because it becomes, and Chris, if he's here, you know, we'll have to have this conversation, which is like, okay, yeah, guys, but how much is too much? How much, all these trucks, oh, they die. Anyway, the trucks, all this, this traffic, Miguel, so while it drives revenue, I get, I'll take it, while it drives it, while it drives revenue, uh, there's a balancing act that the Board of Commissioners has to do uh, as they work with the different agency heads and people who are there and uh, what we will pass and not pass in our respective district, what we will support or whatever the case may be, at least try to shape it is, okay guys, money is not good for money's sake, but it, it is good, it helps you guys do what you need to do to look at our challenge. Think about the citizen impact. I hear a lot of customer base look at it, okay, that's a lot of traffic on our end. Woo! And it matters. So uh, I just want to, it's an observation. Um, I'm, I'm glad you said that they look like we're growing, it's coming, and you're going to read, um, looks like you're going to be bringing your commercial online in what, two phases or three phases? When you do the reassessment or reanalysis of the commercial side of the digest. Uh, it's we have not decided how it would be phased in, but ideally we want to um, do the total aspect of commercial and then go on to personal property. All right, so so hear me out. This this is leadership. So commercial is important. You guys are somewhat embedded. You appreciate raises. You appreciate what you're looking for. And I'm sitting here like, okay, now when is that commercial gonna come online? Now, how do we balance this out? That's when the numbers get real. Right. You, you got and so I'm, 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 how do you how do you maintain this? This is so this is a serious conversation. I can only speak for myself, but it's like I'm listening. And I hear your heart. I appreciate the cheerleader. I appreciate the, what I'm feeling. Like no, I got y'all heading the right direction. Now, how can I really get behind this and take care of something that hasn't really been historically taken care of? Right? Y'all want toys, or you want this, right? So my, here I am like, now how am I going, what, what's my boat going to be? How I, what, what, what's important? What's really, really important? He's key. Him and Greg are like, they, they are buds. So it's like, okay, now how is this really going to come in? Without being manipulated and being true? Make sure the number's right? right? 
Yeah. Big scash to care. That's right, that's right. But, but you, I think you guys get it, so I, I, I really don't have a question. I just wanted to highlight the importance of, of paying attention so that I don't have to study anything. I can read the numbers right during the moment. Like I say, okay, it's going to take 10 years, guys. It's going to take what it's going to take, but, um, and you got to anticipate the reality of the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Right, so we're trying to get you guys the tools that you want, but we also have to be honest about like, okay, so that we can level set um, your, our, our respective staff members and employees. And I'm, I'm glad to hear the morale going in the right direction. It is a good thing. But we were committed to this to change the atmosphere because we live in a different time. We're in reconstruction of America. And so I'm just, I only care about that time. That's, that's all I care about. But this is, this is a good conversation and it's something that we'll probably continue on. I won't belabor it, that just made up my time for not speaking this morning. So I'm gonna yield back, I just wanna make my statement. I'm good, you're good, thank you. Thank you, you're good. And go. Oh, my name is Milton Kidd, for those of you that have not met me, I'm the Director of Elections and Registration. I am going to try to do this in an expeditious manner. Um, all of the other departments, including Steve, you get the money, but this department is the voice of the people. As far as a lot of us operate with SPLOS funding and different things like that, you get that special, <laughs> special purpose uh, local option sales tax by the voice of the people elections. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, on this year, we did operate um, the largest uh, runoff election in U.S. history. We also received uh, uh, 565,407 565, non-governmental grants. The reason why that's important, these are not grants that are just given out to departments or agencies. We have grown out and sought funding for our department. For the last two years, my department has gotten over $2 million or so in grant funding. We are out here working to not just be a burden on the budget for the county, but to bring in revenue as well. What we do at the department, we also have intergovernmental agreements with the cities of Douglasville and city of Villarica to conduct their elections. When I leave here today, I'm gonna to go certify two elections. Um, we maintain a presence in the office during a pandemic, we are not able to work from home. We were in the office. This is my shameless plug to the Board of Commissioners. If we do go through another pandemic type situation, to include my staff with hazard pay because we could not operate from home. We were in the office all of 2020 and all of 2021. Um, we do conduct municipal elections for the municipalities within the cities of Douglasville and cities of Villarica. We also have small part of our sale. Uh, cross comparison, election years flow between years. Uh, for last year, like I said, we got 1.7 million in non-governmental grant funding. We did operate our office. We did conduct municipal elections. These are just some facts and figures. The slide mentioned the runoff election was the largest runoff election in U.S. history for Douglas County and uh, the state. Oh, we had 62,440 voters. That's in comparison to a general election of 69,774 voters. So almost a complete turnaround in a four week cycle of an election that's very hard to do. <laughs> Some of our goals for next year, we are, thanks to the Board of Commissioners, implementing a new training platform to modernize our training with our poll workers in a digital fashion that we just voted on. Thank you, Board of Commissioners, on yesterday. We will be going through working with GIS to complete a redistricting phase. That redistricting phase comprises of changing your uh, federal, state, and local lines. So it's the uh, uh, federal government, the state government, the local school boards, all of those lines will be changed and all those voters have to be moved that are affected in these different districts. This is government that we're in here. We're here because of the people. So the voice of the people matters. Um, we will be adding additional precincts so we don't own any of our polling locations. So that will be me going out, finding locations, getting partnerships with businesses, agencies, or whatever to house our polling locations. <coughs> 
we will be going up on the number of polling locations for Douglas County due to this reallocation that is currently in the process of taking place. Uh, I am in the process of also trying to secure additional grant funding for the department. If it's out there as far as funding, I want it for our department and our people. This is uh, our budget, you will see. It's the standard budget. We did uh, offer any uh, packs uh, for this budget with additions to core because all of what we do is essentially core. Uh, we'll, my only uh, shameless plug to the Board of Commissioners for additions, this is something that I keep addressing with you all. I, <laughs> uh, I know that uh, we're having discussions with the county administrator on an administrative building or a moving of some sort, so they just me throwing that out there since I have the floor. <laughs> uh, I can go now. <laughs> Any questions for the board? Any questions? Very good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rosalind Miller and I work for Terminus, but however, I am helping supporting um, Douglas County's Finance Department. They do have two positions vacant, the Director of Finance and the Deputy Director of Finance. So I am helping and I'm part of the team. <laughs> cheerleader in this space I just wanted to do like a <laughs> but, uh, I'm not yeah I'm not I'm like, I know I don't have time but I would if I had time I would do a double slip <laughs> okay well I'm here to put everything together so what you heard on October the 8th with the elected officials and now with your departments now I'm going to put it all together and see. So your guidelines, and this is part of your finance um, policy guidelines. It states that your um, revenue that you are going to receive would be like this year for 2021 would have to be the same as your um, next year. So we're um, proposing that in at the end of this year, we will receive 104. And you re recall that number in mid-year budget and that David Corbin said, this is your number. So that is our number in revenue that we're um, projecting. <coughs> and as you see today, as, as the um, as chair mentioned for um, 2022, that expenditures are coming in at 103. So this is good. This is good that we're in line with the anticipated revenues. Um, also, I wanna make a note that 104 is operations. It's um, recurring expenditures. So your one time, those are the um, your um, taxes that you've heard. And also the total, um, the $23 million. So it's not in, it's not in that 104. I mean the 103. So this is uh, revenue and this is um, broken out, your recurring revenues, revenues that we know we're going to receive. We know we're gonna receive property tax loss and your um, TAV um, tax and other um, taxes. And again, the recurring revenue is 104. Now your expenditures, uh, um, this is by um, category, um, general government, judicial and public safety. And again, your 2022 um, proposed budget is, priority is public safety. Public safety is 36% of expenditures. So again, um, your budget is priority of public safety. And then um, general government and judicial. Okay, uh, this is a projected of fund balance. Like if we were going to end now, 
Again, you see the um, projected revenue at 104, and currently your projected expenditures are 93 million. And again, this is for um, 20 this year. However, in that number, it's not a full year of the facilities that have come on. It was only six months. So, um, and so we're anticipating 93 million. However, it's not full year of facilities, okay? So we're anticipating about 10.8 million into fund balance. Your beginning was 36. We're um, projecting to um, end with 47.2 million in fund balance. Now let's put this into your fund balance policy, how it looks. So the available fund balance um, that was the 47, the 38 million, um, term, the 47 turned into 38 million, and that is um, due to unrestricted. I removed it. Um, it's outstanding POs, um, kind of what Sharon mentioned. So I reduced the number. I anticipated it'll be. It's usually around nine million dollars worth of unrestricted um, right that you have to hold because we've already obligated. Okay, so I reduced the um, number to 38. So um, per your policy, you have to um, remove or set aside 12% of that number because that's the minimum. You cannot go any lower than um, that 11.2. 11 11 so we hold that over. So then we state, okay, your unrestricted fund balance is now is 27 million. And then also per um, policy, you can take 25% of that number and hold it over for capital. And as you recall last year, you did the same, but you used the three. So, so we don't have any in capital, so, but um, per the policy, you can hold 25%. So then your unrestricted is now 20 million. Now I just, I highlighted that and I, I just put that number in, but this number can be, is, is the board, a board's choice. But I just um, put that number in just to show you, if you use the whole 20.2 million, you would be at your 12%. You, you would be at that number. And again, um, the numbers, uh, the 104 also does not include, because the 104, is recurring expenditures. I mean, the 103 is recurring expenditures, and so matched up with the recurring revenue. Now you have non-recurring, and um, you have to recall that it's going to be um, the 10, 5, the percent, the increases, the um, incentives for the employees. So that's not a part. So I've heard, like, how will it look, you know, in two years? So let's just say this is two years and now that money we have to match revenue with. And if there's no revenue, we would have to take from that ride. And um, for the first year, for the um, total, it's about $8 million. So either you have to find $8 million to match that revenue or you're gonna go into fund balance. So you have to think about this year what you do because if you take all of that and then you're only left. So the board has options, but they also have hard decisions. <laughs> so, um, and again, that's the 12%. So that's how it would look today. And if you use this money and also the pat, um, your the list of the 23 one-time items, there, there, we have some funding sources and we'll provide that. We're gonna provide the whole list and give you the um, funding sources, which is ARPA, but what's ever left over, you know, again, you have options. And that's it. Uh, All right, here we go. So that, that was good, good segue. Again, I'm, I'm awake. Um, I, 
I got a question for you. This is important. Um, I was quiet because you guys moved a little fast. You had your opening comments about the the the, the budget, and all I wrote down was okay. We went from nine to one hundred four, and it's like that was too fast. <laughs> I really couldn't hear nothing else because like, uh, I had to get into you guys, but it's like, how do you make up that difference? That's in my mind. Now, now I'm listening to this narrative, and I, I was silent by design. Ooh, y'all didn't factor in the constitutional officers, or did I hear that? that did I hear the opening comments, uh, we'll let y'all work out how we fit them in. Did I hear that right? No, they're included. Yeah, they're, 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 they're included. But, but Chair, where's the county minister? She made a comment that it was the decision of the Board of Commission to determine how we address them and the budget. <laughs> I, I'm, can you help me understand what that was? Yes, Commissioner. They're, they're in the base. Their base budget is incorporated in the 103, mm -hmm. but they also had a long list of additional items that they wanted which is above the core. Yeah. So their base budget is budgeted. They're incorporated as part of the 103. But they also had many things that they asked you for. Yes, yeah, and yeah. they had so, a long list. All right, so the general government list is what? 102 million. And what is their list? It's, I, I'm back to well, they're, they're part of the... They're part of the base. Yeah, they're, they're part of the base. They're the traditional. I understand, so, but what about above me on it? Um, yeah. I'm just looking for the single view, right? I'm trying to see this. So the whole 20 million, that includes everything. That is correct, yes. Yeah. And we'll give you the whole list yeah. so you can actually see it all together instead of the slides. Yeah, and yeah. on the slides that you have today, it has detail because we know it went really fast. So in your handout, it has, you know, I want 100,000, but it breaks it down into a Ford Ranger, a piece of equipment. The details are in there. And we did the same thing when we did the constitutionals, but we will give you a consolidated list. But the base is covered. Does that answer the question? Uh, so it's, it's okay. This, this is a new way of doing it. Um, I, 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 you know, the budget retreat is sort of sacred for the board of commissioners for the five of us to get together. We need this, this is our, you know, we're all about appropriations. I mean, one job is to appropriate. So I always look forward to this. I'm just trying to get to the point because I know there's some anticipation out there. All right. So just for me, I'm just like, okay, get to the numbers. I'm trying to get to, get get to the budget, get to that that thing, that so we we can make a solid decision. But it's a process. I get it, and I'm, I'm okay with it. And it didn't, it didn't go fast. You just had to pay attention. It's like okay, you're following this, and and I'm and I'm fine. I, and I'm I'm excited about what I'm hearing. I appreciate you guys' attitude, which makes me even more want to get to the numbers because I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm right, heading in the right direction, but I'm like okay, so I want to be able to. Set expectations. That's all I'm doing. I'm just trying to get to those numbers because this this two months. Y'all know how this works. It goes fast. And I'm sure we walk out of here. I want to be able to walk home with something in my soul and my spirit says, "Okay, y'all know we ain't got number two more meetings before it's live for the public." It's gonna go fast. That's all. And I'm, it's a positive thing. This is not like last year. We're in a totally different place. So so this is anticipatory. This 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 is not. <laughs> Two years ago, whatever last year, it's this year. I'm okay. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to see what it really is that y'all looking for. Because at some point, we all got to take our position and sponsor something, right? We, we're the ones who got to smooth off. I mean, 99 percent of it is already done. We, we're gonna sit here and debate over a penny, one percent, right? But it's going to matter. It's going to determine what goes in and what doesn't go in. And so that's why while we're here. Uh, I'm just trying to get my feel for what, what where you guys are. So I, I know we, courtesy of the, the cap uh, on the policy, it, it, we know what, what it is, but I'm, looking, I'm like, look at that cash sitting there, though. Yeah, I said, y'all was- No, 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 don't look at the cash. Don't, don't look at the cash. I'm pretending you didn't see the cash. I, I know, but, 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 but this was my challenge. Did, when I heard you getting up to 47 million, and that's half your budget, and no, no, it was like I was with, with um, 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 Sharon Worthen back the last time. He's like, you cannot sit on that much cash. 
you got to give that. I mean, it, 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 that's when he began to build an animal shelter and all that. No, pay attention. That's a lot of cash for the government to sit on. We're not, we're not Apple. We're not private sector. Now, it's healthy. I get it. It better be purposeful. So my, my challenge to you is that I hear you, hear my words. I just want you to make sure you have some type of framing for it. You cannot sit on that much cash, guys. At some point, you it, it's probably not a good look that you sit on that much cash. I thought we were a, a nonprofit. I, I, I thought we were, I mean, 50% reserve, that's, that's rude. Oh, we have business, too. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone because I'm going to stand in my one lane on that. But I just wanted to make the point to you two to make sure that you can give account for us when, it, when we get hit. When people ask me, well, that seems like a lot of cash because yeah. I'm not the only person that can figure this out. And if you're challenged, I want to make sure you have an answer for that. It says that you've got a laundry list and things that are in queue and you're just preserving it. So I, I think you hear my point. That's a lot, guys. We've never been that high. Yes. And it's the help. <laughs> Only funded six months worth of stuff to, to ride. Yeah, yes. I understand. But it's a lot of cash. Yeah, y'all miss. I'm not No, I'm not debating with myself on this one. This is what I'm gonna let y'all do what y'all are talking about. Like, okay, I'm gonna stay over here. Because it, it, it's a point that you guys, Ross, you know what my point is. I'm gonna leave it there. I'm good. Thank you. Let's go. Let's go. One thing that I, I want to stress is, you know, when we build our fund balance, it gives you as elected officials options. You know, and, and when you have options, you can look at those one-time things and you can make strategic decisions. You know, when we're covering at that base policy rate, you have the flexibility. The other thing that I really believe in is prepare for a rainy day because something bad happens in the county, you know, a pandemic, or, you know, or, or a flood, or, or a fire, or something bad happens, we have a little bit of a cushion. And the other thing I would love to get to the point of, which is, this is obviously a policy decision, but right now we take a tan every year, you know, when we get to the point where our cash flow is, is optimum, maybe that's something we decide that we don't want to do. Policy decision, um, but those are, those are all options because you have a bigger fund balance, you get to have <coughs> options. So I know that you don't want to be 50% reserved, um, but I also think you know when, when Ross does that list of things that carry over, it is gonna be a significant risk. The other thing you all need to know is, I said I would talk about DDS later. Well, our DDS, um, estimate of what our infrastructure cost was going to be just came back and it's probably about 100 percent more um, so we were thinking it was in the range of 650 yeah. 700 um, they're giving us an estimate of 1.5 and that's just for the infrastructure well not just clear they have to they're, they're putting in infrastructure everything from fiber to sewer. So, you know, those are things that are unexpected. You've already made a big commitment. We want this here. But that's the kind of thing that happens, that it's not a plus funded project, but that would be one of those ideal things that when you have a fund balance, you don't have to sweat it. You can say, you can make the policy decision that we're in it, we want it, and now we have the money to be able to do it. No, you're sharing that with all of them. I actually get that. I think my, my, my point was, we can always rationalize the spend. It's the cost of it. Okay, guys, we're all on the inside here, and I hear y'all. But I, I, I get to be on the front page. And it's like, no, I get it. I'll cover y'all, but y'all gotta come up with a reason. Like, okay, uh huh. We're the ones to make the vote. And so I hear you. And I get right there, this all sounds good. Y'all should say those proper words. It sounds good. Like, okay. I'm good too. Like, y'all get at this? It's a positive thing, but it's like, I'm like, all right, here's my question. How much percentage of that art list and your current cash is shiny objects versus pay? Answer me that question. Where's our board? Answer me quick math. At percentage of the art, how much we put to employees and how much we put to everything else shiny objects? Do that for both 
this current budget growth from last year this year and that. I want you to answer that before the end of the day. You can't do it right now, but I want to know this answer. Because where I'm going is just like, okay. All right, what's our priority? So we use cash for a moment. You can't be in both worlds. Some people do not get sacrifices, my point. I'm going to say this one time. You're not going to be able to do all of it. So, I'm setting the leadership expectation. Oh, I'm fine. I need to one vote. I'm going to go with what the majority say. But, I'm like, I, mean, I, I get it, guys. I'm excited. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm going to give you your tools. You're empowered. You're going to do the things. But also, I'm going to take care of the people. Take care of your staff. Now, how are we going to do both? But you want to, your career is going to be successful. You're going to move forward. You're going to put your stuff in your resume. You're going to go higher, better. <laughs> Got it. But you also have dependents, which is called staff. But you got to take care of. You got to feed them. Now, what's the priority? The parents or the kids? Not out, hanging out with your new toys, or, or make sure that they're properly <coughs> so you can do it. Like, this is a mature conversation. And I, I know this is a good room for this, but that's where we are. It's a good problem. I mean, that's what that is. You don't have to fake the answer. Don't, 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 don't stunt the answer right there. This is a very thoughtful that we can actually be here and be mature about it. Just think about it. We're good. We got let them chair. We got time. But that's the whole point of having this very mature conversation. It's not political. It's not that I got y'all looking at this. We all, we've heard you. And that's one, I mean, I'm glad we did get to hear all y'all. Y'all came correct. Like, we're encouraged. Like, okay. We want to, I, I want to take care of you. Like, okay, now, what's the point? Now, 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 same way you take care of your step, I got to take care of y'all. What's my point in this moment? And that, that, that's important for just me alone. I, I can't speak wholly, but I've got an independent contract like my other four peers. Um, and, and they're all wholly equal to one vote. But at the same point, it's like, this is good stuff. So I'm, I'm going to yield my chair. This is a good thing. I'm excited, though. Thank you. I'm excited. Yes. I'm excited. It's time. Last year, we said there's no room for second place, and we are now in first place. So I want us to celebrate. And I'm scared to quote 50 Cent, but he said, get rich of no one. <laughs> Positivity rate is about 4%. So all of that is good news to celebrate. We also have 50% of our residents are have one do, excuse me, one dose of the vaccine. So I'm excited about that. We rolled out the vaccine yesterday to the five to 11 year olds. Um, and so we've begun for those families who wanna be able to vaccinate their younger children. We've begun doing that in clinic and in mobile settings. And so we're excited about that. Um, we also will be continuing our homebound vaccinations. Right now, we're not doing the homebound children yet. We've got to make sure that we've got good pediatric folks that can go out um, and do that, but we'll be rolling that out as well. So let's just talk a little bit about some of our, uh, also we are still doing, if you didn't know, we're still doing full testing out at Arbor Place Mall. And so that's free and we want to make sure that folks know that. And we're continuing to do all brand 
uh, vaccinations in clinic, in mobile settings, and uh, in homebound. And a special shout out this week to uh, Senior Services uh, for letting us come out and do some of those um, booster vaccinations for our seniors. That's been really popular, I think. I think you said we had about 150 people yesterday. 100 people yesterday. So great turnout for that. I'm excited about that. A few of our accomplishments this year, one I would just say provided the COVID-19 response. That has been what we have been living and breathing and staying up 24-7 uh, about. Uh, part of it's disease for surveillance, and you all, that's an easy term, but what it means is that our staff is either maintaining or inputting about 20 different metrics every single day to make sure that everyone in the community is informed about what the status is. And so that's been a, a significant investment. We also do all of the, deep, the outbreak investigations, the case investigations, and the contact tracing with every positive case in Douglas County. And so our epidemiologists have been working around the clock um, this past year to make sure that happens. We've done an awful lot of consulting with folks in uh, the departments within Douglas County, but also all of our local businesses, um, churches, schools, to help them with the mitigation practices and trying to help keep our residents as safe as possible. We've given over 29,000 uh, tests this past year, over 31,000 vaccinations, um, and we felt like there was a need, of course, in the um, food insecurity issues that was kind of an unintended consequence of the pandemic. And so we were able to get some money in through Ipsum Diagnostics, who is our testing partner, um, and we were able to give over 15,000 boxes of produce, fresh produce, out to our residents. And so all of those feel very um, full-time, but it, while we were doing all of that, we were maintaining all of our traditional public health services. We didn't uh, miss a beat. Our staff continued to report every single day, and we either provided our services virtually, digitally, or in a drive-through manner, or still face-to-face. -face. You know, it's difficult to give an immunization if you're not right there with the person. So a lot of all of our staff continue to show up and do all of our traditional public health services. Um, I am excited, if you didn't hear about it from Dr. Meemark, uh, we did achieve our FAB accreditation. That's our National Public Health Accreditation. We were the first in Georgia back in 2015 uh, to become accredited nationally. We are the first in Georgia and among the top 10% in the country uh, to become re-accredited. Many public health departments lapse their accreditation uh, during the pandemic just because it, does, it is a heavy lift. But our staff and Dr. Meemark said, you know what, we need to maintain this quality and these standards. And so we pushed forward and we achieved that reaccreditation. So we're excited about that. And that I hope reflects to you a level of quality in our services um, and some national standards that we maintain. We also maintain a balanced budget. Thank you very much for your help with all of that. Um, but we were pleased to be able to do that. And that's in light of even some decreased uh, clinical services. Many people during the pandemic, when we talk about the unanticipated challenges, you know, one of the challenges that we've had is that our clinical service volumes decreased. Many people um, ended up having fears about accessing medical services because of COVID exposure. And so across the country, we've seen a decrease in chronic disease um, services and medical services for because folks were afraid to go into hospitals and physician offices and public health clinics. And so even though we had a reduction in our clinical services, we still were able to maintain a balanced budget um, for that. Part of that came from uh, being able to divert many and needing to divert many of our clinical staff to the COVID response. And so we kept everybody working um, and we were able to continue and adjust as we needed. Um, our Power and Truth Conference got national awards. You all know that we're on about year 18 of the Youth Power and Truth Conference that we do every year in partnership with Douglas County Schools. Um, this past year, um, unlike some conferences who said, you know what, we're going to take a pass um, on the conference this year, 
our staff said we, we can't take a pass. These youth need this information, they need this support. And so our staff and many partners in the community, um, including folks on the Douglas County staff, worked with us to transition that in-person conference to a digital platform. And we uh, went from about 500 participants to 2,500 participants um, in that conference and received a national award for being able to make that adjustment. We decided to continue to do it digitally this year. Uh, it is, has just launched in the last week or so, and we're also seeing great response again this year digitally. We may do some combination of that this next year because it has been so positive in reaching more youth than we did in past years. Um, we also did a number of site improvements with our Douglas Public Health Center. Uh, you all know that the state of Georgia um, asked the um, counties to be able to provide their facilities and overhead and, and all of that. We had some money in also in our reserves. And so instead of asking you all to provide those improvements, we said, you know what, we've got funding to be able to do that we will uh, invest a half a million dollars in our roof and our HVAC system and our parking lot renovations. And so we were able to do that and not come to you all and ask for that to happen um, this year and still raise the bar again on our facility for public health. Um, we, for this year, we, uh, you all contributed the 382,000, from the general fund to us. Um, and also the million and up to the million and a half for us for the CARES funding. Thank you so much for that. It has made a huge difference in us being able to continue to provide public health services while at the same time responding to the pandemic. We are asking you this year to go up to about pre-pandemic level, which is about $410,000. So about a little less than a $30,000 increase we're requesting and then we still are in the midst of this pandemic. We're still rolling out vaccines. We're still doing testing. We're still doing all the disease investigation. So we are asking you to set aside up to the half a million dollars in the ARPA funds so that we can have access to that. Uh, again, that's a reimbursable grant that we would submit to you each month. Um, our goals are the continued pandemic response. We are not through this yet and not through the residuals of it. Uh, increased delivery of our public health services and getting back focused on our strategic <coughs> plans. There are a lot of public health issues in Douglas County, including the opioid issue, food insecurity, um, chronic diseases, all those things need our attention and we need to turn, we need to redeploy our staff back to some of those priorities. And then our focus uh, continues to be on a health equity basis to be able to provide the services that a community needs within the county um, based on what they need and what the issues are in that community. We are not a one size fits all across the county. There are a variety of needs in different pockets that we need to make sure we're filling. So we look at that data and we try to make decisions of where targeted needs are. And then as uh, folks mentioned, before uh, the workforce sustainability has hit public health just as hard as it has everywhere else. Um, we have had folks that have just gotten really tired and they've chosen other lines of work or they've taken retirement opportunities. And so we have got to be able to put some attention into the recruitment and retention of qualified public health folks. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the consideration of again, supporting the agency this next year. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for all the hard work and uh, just the trials and tribulations that the Public Service, uh, Public Health Department has endured this uh, last 20 months. You all have done a yeoman's job. I tell Thank you, you so much. Trying to change behavior, uh, putting, uh, changing the behavior of our whole entire population, both Douglas and Carr, uh, into a medical setting because everybody now understands surgery, infection control, uh, sterilization, disinfection. So thank you all for learning at this new behavior, this new norm, uh, and appreciate you. And I appreciate serving as one of the board of directors yes. for public health, and appreciate everything that you have for me, Mike, and your amazing team are doing to move Douglas County forward. Thank you. I appreciate thank your you. leadership. It was the right person at the right time that we needed that had the medical background to help us through this. 
Uh, I also have to do a major shout out to all of the leadership within the Douglas County folks. Uh, we couldn't have done it without EMA and without senior services and communications. Um, everybody, truly everybody, pulled together to help us whenever we needed it. Um, so thank you so much for that. Or do you have any questions for Ms. Crossman? I mean, wait just one second. The mission guide has a question. Yes, ma'am. You quoted the number of cases. How many deaths has occurred in Douglas County this year? I'm sorry? How many deaths? I want to say about two, just under 250. I want to check on This that. year? Uh, yes. Well, since the pandemic began, I would have to pull the number to see for January through to date. Is that what you're asking? This yes, week? just for this year. Okay. Uh -huh. I will pull that and send that back to you. It's been about just under 250 for the full pandemic response. Okay, I, I'm just interested in this year because you, you quoted the cases, and so uh, just wondered where yep. we stood with the number. I can uh, look that up for you before I leave and let you know that. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, we are seeing, you know, deaths unfortunately are a lagging. Um, <coughs> consequence of the pandemic of the infections and so we are just now starting to see the deaths decline as a result of that fourth surge that came up and so we're excited about that but we're not quite out of the woods yet with folks who have been hospitalized who have been in serious condition so but I'm hopeful is this wood under here um, I am hopeful that we are um, recovering out of that and our our it's tough. Our staff works with every one of those families that have lost a loved one um, to work with them, and it's their hard stories. So, but thank you for asking about that. Okay. Anybody talk a little bit about booster shots, like for our booster shots, especially yes, for our, our staff. <laughs> yeah, so these are your okay. directors, so they are the ones who will be talking to you. You know, okay. their staff. So booster shots, uh, first of all, all are available now for all brands, okay? So if you are, um, have had a J&J &J booster, you just have to be two months past your J&J &J shot to get a booster, and it's recommended for everybody over 18. For the Pfizer and Moderna, there are a few other guidelines. So first of all, we have Pfizer and Moderna available to everybody throughout the county. There's no shortage of any vaccine. The recommendation for folks to get a booster is, first of all, six months past your second dose. So that's the first box you have to check, that you're six months past your second dose. The second box is, are you over 65 or in a long-term care facility that's recommended for those folks? Are you 18 or older and you have some underlying health conditions? And there's really a very broad definition of underlying health conditions like, uh, you know, am I, do I have hypertension? Do I have diabetes? Do I, am I overweight? Uh, do I suffer from depression or anxiety? There's a very long list of underlying health conditions that qualify you for a booster. And then the last is, are you, under, are you over 18 and you work in a very forward-facing role? Um, so if you're in a job that puts you in contact with a lot of people, easy is you know, grocery store workers and teachers and healthcare workers, but really any profession that puts you out and about into the community, you also qualify for boosters. So it's a really long list of folks who can get a booster shot at this point, and we encourage it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Anybody else? Thank you. Appreciate y'all's time today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are y'all awake out here? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. My name is Emily Leitner. I'm the Executive Director for the Cultural Arts Council here in Douglasville and Douglas County. Thank you for taking the time to allow us to present today about what we've been able to accomplish with our 2021 funds. It has been a very busy year. Uh, we've been able to build up our cash reserves to $50,000 this year, which is a huge accomplishment considering the circumstances, and offer nine outstanding exhibits bringing internationally renowned artists to Douglas County. We expanded the Art on Loan program to this facility, so I hope you get a chance to see it on your way out. 
And our Family Arts Ventures made a return to the Douglas County school system, bringing in 12 curriculum-based performances into the school, reaching over 3,000 students. We recruited 15 new art instructors, offering a diverse class representation, and adapted and presented a safe, sold-out spring break and summer arts camp this year. We were able to present 10 scholarships to Title I students in the school system for a week-long, all-intensive, hands-on workshop and adapted and presented a safe, sold-out Mad Hatter Tea Party as well. In addition, we presented the sold-out annual chili cook-off just a couple weeks ago, and we exceeded our net goals. And adapted and presented the Taste of Douglasville, which in addition exceeded our goals, and added three new satellite organizations, now totaling nine organizations, which are nonprofit arts entities. We have hosted 12 pop-up art shops by the end of 2021, totaling over $2,700 so far brought in a new public art initiative called Art Pop ATL, valued at over $10 million in ad space throughout the state of Georgia, promoting Douglas County and what we have to offer, and including artists. Brought in over $197,000 in grants and support, not including the county support in FY21. We were able to raise over $73,000 in fundraisers in FY21, and our membership drive surpassed our FY20 numbers by $1,500. Mm -hmm. So we had a very successful year, reaching a lot of accomplishments, and those were just a few until I ran out of space. <laughs> and <laughs> addition though, unanticipated challenges, as everyone has talked about the pandemic and unanticipated challenges that we're reaching, the CAC always seeks to believe in the best, but plan for the worst, to prevent these unanticipated challenges for happening. And for example, we had to move our taste fundraiser to the CAC, but when we were making these plans, we were already thinking about plan A, plan B, plan C, and what we need to do to make those happen. And looking at our comparative analysis from 2020 to 2021, and I want to make a special note that CAC runs on a fiscal year basis of July 1 to June 30th. And as you can see, the CAC continues to seek outside funding sources from fundraisers, foundations, corporations, grant, and in addition, I think it's important to know our in-kind donations. We couldn't do everything that we do without our in-kind donation support. And for the state Georgia's audit requirements, the county fiscal year number represents a contracted allotment, but may have not been received in that designated fiscal year. So for example, the FY20 funding did not come in until FY22 for us, and FY2021 funding did not come in until 2022. So looking ahead and looking at our request for goals for 2022 and how we're going to accomplish these is talking with the community, finding out what our community wants, what can we do to better benefit and serve our community. And one of those things is a new multicultural event that we're going to offer in 2022. In addition to continuing to build our cash reserves by another $10,000, expand the Art on Loan program to the Woody Fight Senior Center, create a new maintenance and facilities plan, create a draft of the new five-year strategic plan, which would begin in 2024, complete necessary repairs, renovations for the CAC buildings, bring in $11,000 in memberships for our FY22, increase volunteers and satellite organizations by 10%, and have a diverse revenue to be reflected through government, fundraising, sponsorships, grants, and membership. Analyze and achieve maximum facility, rental income, and create a new marketing plan, bring in new public art projects to our community, and lastly, meet the net goal for each of our CAC's major fundraisers, the Taste, Chili, and Annual Gala Auction. That's all I have today. I thank you so much to the Douglas County Board of Commissioners, our department staff, for continuing to support the CAC and making a difference in our community. Any questions? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Chris Pumphrey, uh, representing the Development Authority of Douglas County, Elevate Douglas, City of Douglas Hill Development Authority, and we wear many hats. Um, 
just like Emily, I was trying to fit a lot of accomplishments on the one page, and so it's pretty difficult to do that. So um, a, few, a few things we'll touch on. Uh, we did launch Elevate Douglas, and I'll really talk about the importance of that from a financial standpoint um, later on. I'm being a little presumptive here that we are going to have the tax allocation district approved uh, go, uh, by the end of the year. Um, we did execute our purchase and sale agreement with Foxfield Company that is for the Richardson track that we've been working on for several years. That's the fulfillment of that master plan you all adopted three years ago. Um, we were awarded the Georgia Project of the Year by Area Development Magazine. Um, they gave Georgia the Silver Shovel Award for the, for the state and Bang Energy Project was the Georgia Project of the Year. So we received that award uh, earlier this year. Um, just from an economic development activity standpoint, um, we've had, uh, this action number is wrong, I got it updated, it's about 55 uh, active projects throughout the year representing over 6,800 jobs. We anticipate about two announcements coming by year end that represent 1,300 of those jobs. Um, and we did earlier this year announce Endeavor 3D and their 3D manufacturing facility. Um, one of the things that the community talks about a lot about is tax abatements and companies not paying taxes or if we give an abatement, then they're gonna leave when that abatement's over. Um, so I would say those things are not true. Um, for two of our projects, the Cross Waterhouse Cooper's Data Center, which came here back in 2008, I believe, uh, we closed out that abatement this year. Um, and actually that abatement was supposed to extend through 2024, but they decided to forego those final two years. So that would be 100% taxable both real and personal property going into 2022. Uh, met, uh, Sherry helped me with this roughly by $548,000. So that will be on the tax digest uh, next year. And then we also close out the real estate for Medline um, for pre projected for 2022, roughly $434,000 for, for next year. That's just based on today's knowledge rates. Um, some of the unanticipated challenges, I guess the flip side of kind of what you all are experiencing trying to find staff it's, it's also the, the same issue for all of our industries around the county, really trying to help them in identifying talent um, to, to bring into their, their locations. Um, and then part of that also for us has been working with the chamber um, in Elevate Douglas in bringing on the full staff that we really need to bring on. We have brought on a lot, but still not been able to fulfill that. Um, I took the comparative analysis from an activity standpoint. Last year, uh, we had 39 active projects. Um, we had about seven wins, resulting in 880 jobs, 600 plus million dollars of capital investment. And um, we also did the small business program in partnership with the Chamber. Um, for 2021, as I mentioned earlier, about 55 um, total projects, about four wins. Um, we've got three that we anticipate um, announcing. I think I mentioned two earlier, but there are a total of three. Um, that will uh, equate to, I'm sorry, I messed this up. There's four, pr four project wins, Project Silver, Boost, FX, and Endeavor 3D. Um, and the Endeavor 3D is the two is uh, roughly 90 jobs uh, coming from that. And all of these all together um, is over $200 million of investment. So for going into 2022, our budget, the way that we do economic development through the Development Authority is not a sustainable model. Um, we get about, on average, the last several years, we get about $300,000 from the county. I think last year we got two seventy-five. dollars um, We did up, uh, get an increase through the city this year, so this year we're getting $100,000 from the city. So that's roughly $400,000 of public um, funds coming into the Development Authority. Our budget, on average, is around a million dollars. So $400,000 to roughly a million dollar budget. And that's really, in order to do everything that's necessitated for economic development, is a lot, there's a lot that goes into that. It's the marketing efforts, it's the workforce efforts, it's, it's all of those diff different things that, that come in and making what we do work. So that's part of what led us into the creation of Elevate Douglas, is to help bring the private sector in to allow us to, to do those things and have a more sustainable model than just depending upon uh, bond revenues. If you don't get a bond close in a particular year, that's just revenue you don't get. So that's what I say, it's an unsustainable model to really do everything that's necessary for economic development. So we're grateful for your support um, in supporting uh, our efforts in economic development. So we are updating our strategic plan. We're going through that process right now. We're starting the interviews, start actually next week. Um, and then that will launch us into our capital campaign for Elevate Douglas, where we'll be having the private sector come in and kind of help offset some of those expenditures so that when we do get those bond proceeds, we can put them into special projects. 
So for as an example, for the Richardson property, we've put roughly $300,000 of just reserve funds into that project to date, and we're not done yet. Um, and so we're, I'm sorry. So, so the Richardson property is the project that, that we've been working on um, at Lee Road and Fairburn Road, which is the core of the tax allocation district. And so we put that property under option two years ago, um, and then we've paid, been paying consultants, we've been getting engineering work done, we've got borings that we're about to start in the next week. Um, and so there's just a lot of work that goes into that. But that's, that's, how we're, that's how we would prefer to use our reserves, is to invest them into those projects and then have consistent revenue that allows us to then go out and do the marketing, to go out and work with the existing industries, to go out and put maybe grant programs into place to help secure some of these projects. So um, we'll be doing those things. Part of that plan hopes to include, um, well, we hope to be breaking ground on the Richardson property by the summer of next year. Um, we'll be doing quarterly economic development updates through our partnership with Elevate, Elevate Douglas. Um, and with our strategic plan, we hope to be engaging in the master planning efforts, looking at what are development opportunities in the future. We talked about the trucks and the, the concentration in particular areas. What are the new opportunities that exist on High, Highway 78 on the west side? Um, and then also looking at the opportunity for um, uh, com community improvement districts, particularly around Thornton Road and particularly around the Mall area. That's all my time. We have a bunch of rock stars, a bunch of generals in here, and, and, and really no, no doubt. But Jamie, like, until you you can't scale, you can only do you. And I think about like, now what if we had actually invested in you the way it would have been more ideal? If you can put 4.3 billion up on the books and be one of the top 50 national executive directors in the nation. But he's got these in that little house. He ain't got nothing to work with. He's a hunter, but then wh wh where's everybody else to really be able to do this? It, it is not a sustainable model. So I don't ever want you to think, like, I know what you've done for the county, and I appreciate the work, but yet, it, it, I mean, again, you bring it in, it's up to us to chop it up, close it up, do what we got to do. Um, and, and so, but the, the model that was constructed that we now are overseeing, it may need to be revisited. Um, you know, it, it's maybe need to look looked at differently. I hear you, uh, but this makes me think, hmm, and it's nothing I can solve right now, but to the point, like with all of you guys, it's like, okay, we need to revisit these things. You don't have to keep maintaining the old, same old thing. Restructure, recalibrate. I mean, that's the whole point when it, when it, it ran this useful life. So you give me something to think about. That's all I just, I heard you and you didn't really ask for anything, so I guess he's okay. So I'm gonna put the new back to you back here. <laughs> he's <I> really asked. <laughs> 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 I heard it, it was implied, I heard it. What was it, 375 to 400? So, um, so we have been at 300,000 in the past several years, which is actually a significant increase. My first year here, we were at 25,000 from the county. So we have we have raised, yeah, yeah, really. Um, <laughs> so, so we, yeah, so we, we got up to 300,000. I think last year we were at 275. Um, we'd like to get back up to that 300,000. And as I mentioned, we have 100,000 that comes from the city. So our total public contribution is $400,000. If you look at some of the other counties, um, you know, I would say Cherokee County, for example, they get roughly $600,000 from the county. But their millage rate is a lot more than ours, too. I, I'm Our just, millage yeah. rate is only, you know, yeah. for one mill, it's five and a half. But right. Cherokee, it's almost $15 million. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, wow. we, so we work we work with what we have. Um, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so as you see, the, the, the industrial has, has increased per, fairly significantly you know, over that time period. And we have evolved our, our target sectors that focus on more non-industrial applications. So. that you get a prize if you finish early? Yes. All right, I'm on it. Um, hey everybody, I'm Sarah Ray. I'm the President and CEO of the Douglas County Chamber. I just wanna thank the commissioners for allowing me to come and present to you guys on all the things that have been going on with the Douglas County Chamber over the last year. I will say it has been an adventure coming from 2020 into 2021. We've had a lot of accomplishments. Um, as Chris just mentioned, we formalized our partnership with Elevate Douglas Economic Partnership. We have a joint service agreement with them and we, in which we share staff. So with that partnership, we have onboarded four full-time staff um, that are dedicated into different areas such as events, um, front office coordination, finance. So instead of us having a fifth of a person's position on Chris's team and a fifth of a person doing a little bit of something, they're fully dedicated to doing that and supporting both organizations. So we brought on four and then we actually transitioned one of Chris's team members over to our office. If you want to talk, and I will say, it has been wonderful and it has been an adventure and I will never onboard five people in six months ever again. But we've learned and we've had a great experience and we've got a strong team. Something else that we're very proud of is um, we've dedicated a focus or we've had a, ded a more dedicated focus to reshaping the lens of equity for businesses in the community. Obviously that's been diversity, equity, and inclusion has become an even stronger focus for everyone in our community and the Metro Atlanta region and the nation. And the chamber has been very proud to take a role in that and starting to uh, facilitate those conversations. We do that on a multi-layer approach. That way we meet people where they're at in that space of comfort. So we do things where it's just email sharing information. We've done some in-person events and we've even done some virtual book studies. So that way, as we help people learn and um, know and understand about racial equity and what that means and how they can be a part of that conversation and drive systematic change. It's been very impactful for our community um, as far as we've seen within the chamber. Um, the intentional shift to provide impactful and strategic in events and programming, we have always operated in the space of the more people, the merrier. The more people we can crowd in a room at our Dancing with the Stars, our Winter Ball event, the better off we're gonna be and everybody will have fun. And when the pandemic happened and we weren't able to do that, we realized something. We realized that the, you know, if we have smaller crowds and more targeted intentional events, people have more time to talk to each other, to connect on a more meaningful level. So we've actually shifted a lot of our events to not be large and grandos and, and have had a more strategic focus through women in business breakfast series and we do a minority business breakfast series um, and that's proved to be very successful. Advocacy support on the local, state, and federal level as the voice of business for Douglas County. We are proud to serve as the advocacy arm in support of our businesses, and we do that in partnership um, in soliciting feedback from all of our community partners, whether it's the Water and Sewer Authority, the city, the county, education, healthcare, and so forth. And we're able to advocate and support businesses um, and their objectives. Marketing and communications analysis. One of the great things that we learned during the pandemic was that we are not communicating as effectively as we could be with our businesses. So we actually went through the process of a marketing and communications analysis to learn how we best communicate with our businesses. Um, we also rebranded our Buy Local initiative kind of based on the emotional response that we received from our support of our community and the businesses to our new Buy Local initiative, which is This is Douglas. Um, I brought you guys some copies. You can check out the website, but there's lots of information and it shifts the focus from kind of strong arming people into why they should support local businesses to the more emotional side and flipping the narrative to where it's celebrating the people, the places, and the things that make our community so great. Uh, we we're happy to feature Rick as one of our stories talking about uh, Sweetwater Creek State Park, and we also featured Boundary Waters and the, the trail that's there as well. Unanticipated challenges, I would say, well, we can all raise our hands to this one, navigating the pandemic, supporting businesses in ways that we never thought we would and continue to do that. And then as Chris mentioned, our new team and integrating two organizational cultures, having a lot of freshman team members has been um, an exciting and interesting challenge, but we're continuing to kind of pivot through that. When you look at our comparative analysis, I did mine more on um, kind of bullet points, 
versus financials. Um, in 2020, we had a small business support slash survival as they pivoted to adapt to a rapidly changing environment. And in 2021, that looked more like an intentional focus on meeting the specific needs identified through our funded small business strategy. So again, instead of casting a net at everyone and hoping that they found something that they found value in or supported them, we have a more intentional focus. We also were primarily virtu uh, virtual with our events and um, programming which limited our engagement opportunities. Again, it's harder to connect with people in a virtual space. So we actually restructured our programs, like I just said, and um, you know, we have a strategic and authentic approach behind how we engage our businesses. Um, with the funding, we had a lower revenue stream, obviously, you know, if it's a choice between keeping your chamber membership and keeping the lights on or paying employees, we did experience some of that. We had funding losses in a couple of other areas, um, but the great news is this year we have had um, additional strategic partnerships and increased revenue streams um, through pivoting from the into those targeted events. And we've also seen the uptick on our membership and renewals. We've done a lot of things in a different way to make our businesses find value in what we do. And, and we've seen the dollars reflect that. We also in 2020, we're operating and I would call it kind of like everybody else, gap planning. Um, so we actually had a recovery and resiliency task force that we created to help pivot through the pandemic. And I say that with our business community but also internally with our chamber as well. We operate traditionally on a three-year strategic plan. That should have ended in December of 2020, but then our board was nowhere ready to um, jump into planning. We couldn't plan three weeks out, let alone three years, so we actually gap plan. And then this year, we're just going through the final stages of our three-year strategic planning process. Speaking of, goals for 22, um, we will be going into year one of our strategic plan implementation. That looks at continuing to diversify our membership for our future sustainability. I mean that twofold, that's in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also in the offerings that we offer. I've actually shared this with Commissioner Robinson, but we are also looking at a no cost membership for all businesses in and around Douglas County so that everybody has access to the information and the resources. Um, we are also looking at continuing to work with Chris and his team on building out a strong workforce focus. Again, we've all seen the effects of that and um, the shortage, the hiring shortage, how hard it is to find employees. So we've got some strategic objectives around job creation and supporting businesses. Cultivate and build on our strategic partnerships. That's something that we've got a lot of opportunity in. We don't feel like we have to be the doer of all things and we can't do all things for all people. So fostering and building out those partnerships. And I say that on a local and a regional level. Um, we also are looking at continuing to increase our advocacy and elected official collaboration. We've had some great one-on-one -on -one conversations with our leadership in the community. We actually took a group to Washington DC a couple of months ago and it's just continuing to build that out. So it's not just seeing us and my, you know, myself or Chris or any of our staff in a board of commissioners meeting. We're actually having those opportunities to hear and understand what's going on in your districts as far as businesses and constituents and then take that back so it helps drive what we do in the chamber. As I said, activating our marketing and communication strategy and um, that involves a brand new website, brand new logo. We've got a whole new way of how we're gonna personalize how we communicate with our businesses. Again, as I mentioned, promoting diverse and minority-owned businesses to establish a region as an inclusive community. We have a whole line of objectives in our new strategic plan surrounding that. Continuing our partnership with Elevate Douglas and growing that, we have a few more positions that we've mentioned that we're looking to hire for. So adding some more shared services and looking at the possibility of a shared space, which will probably be in a couple of years. And then amplifying our This Is Douglas initiative, that's looking at billboards and print media, um, even more robust digital campaign, additional partnerships to help build that program out and help our uh, businesses celebrate the community. And then the, uh, the last one I'll mention is a dedicated full-time resource to focus on identifying, coordinating, and promoting all of our small business initiatives. So as I mentioned, we share staff. We want somebody that every day all they're doing is waking up and living and breathing, supporting our businesses. And that's through funding resources, how to do and start a business in Douglas, early stage company business support, small business industry roundtables, mentoring and accountability, grant opportunities, navigating government contracts, incubator and co-working space planning, and then business education toolkits. So just a little bit of work for that person to do when we can find what we would respectfully call a unicorn. So um, I appreciate you guys um, letting me have the time to come and talk to you today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. This is very important. Um, are you doing the uh, lottery tickets? 
raffle. I called you in Mexico to tell you you won one time. <laughs> no, we are not doing the raffle. We um we we have shifted to a more member driven and mission driven focus. So we got rid of the raffle about two years ago because we we wanted to focus on on uh, small business programming and resources that we could direct back into our chamber. So I'm sorry. The Rotary does a raffle though. Yeah. You have a question for yeah. No, I appreciate the update. It, it, that was important. I'm, I'm glad to hear um, there's been a strategic shift in equity and inclusion and diversity. Um, that, that was important for us. Um, and, and you're bringing up a good point but to focus on small business. And we talked about, and you give me your perspective, or give us your perspective, Ray. Uh, I, I don't necessarily believe I agree with that people are lazy because uh, the people won't do the jobs. I think there's a remonetization during this pandemic where people have now seen their value, how they see themselves. And they've got options right now. It's an employee's market. And so I think there's a false narrative out there, but um, and, and, and that's, there's more of a shift that I'm not gonna do like perhaps we work for the, the system 20, 30 years. I'm seeing this newer generation, I'm like, you know, tell me, uh, we ain't going to do it that way. And uh, I'm seeing a, a lot more entrepreneurship, a lot more, we're going to just, things that we would see as being unstable, I just see a, I see a shift in how things are done. What are you seeing? I'm just curious. Two things. One, you're absolutely correct. And we have within our, we did a small business strategy. I guess we started it in July of last year. We debated on if that was the right timing, but then seeing all of the people, um, you know, that were losing their jobs during the pandemic, shifting into running a landscaping business or you know, starting a catering business out of their home or baking cookies, um, you know, we or cutting hair out of their house. We we saw that and so we we um, worked through the the small business strategy and we built out kind of or they have provided us with some resources on we call it turning your five to nine to a nine to five. So we've got some programming that we're looking to roll out. I feel I feel like we call it the Dream Academy. And I can't remember what Dream stands for off the top of my head, but it's basically all inclusive of different types of businesses. So that's something that we're looking at as far as those early stage startups and making sure that people are educated on what it means to start a business. I think it'd be fun to open a coffee shop, but that doesn't mean I know everything about the feasibility, the costs associated with starting a, starting a coffee shop. So, so you're absolutely nail on the head with that one and I completely agree in regards to the issues and the kind of the, the, the disbanding the myth of workforce and that people, you know, that they can't, come off. Ooh, I think I just knocked off. That, you know, that they have, they have the cards in their hand. We dealt with that with hiring a marketing person. We offered a job, her company countered, and we were back to square one. So we lived and breathed it internally. And I'm, I'm excited to say we, we um, that all came out within our strategic planning interview process. So we have items that we're looking at, which include interviewing job seekers of why they, you know, what kind of qualities of things that they're looking at in a workplace. We're also looking at business owners and what they're looking at employees so we can see where the disconnect is. We've also worked um, on compiling a commuter survey. So we are a bedroom community, as you guys know, about 80%, and Chris can probably correct my, my number, about 80% commute outside of Douglas to go to work every day. So what would it take to bring them back here? What are their reasons for going into the city or going to Marietta? Is it child care, access to child care? Is it business incentives? Like what are those tools that we can then leverage to, to have an accountant that goes to Cobb County to be an accountant here? Because the prices, the, co the, the salaries are, are competitive here. But I think to your point, Commissioner Robinson, it's a lot of the marketing and branding behind that and how, and how the businesses promote themselves. So we are excited. And again, I just uh, those are three things that are in our strategic plan to focus on um, going into 2021. So we're going to work on it for you. No, you're good. No response. Yep. I'm good. Not yet. Thank you. Well, you certainly placed uh, quite a bit of interest, um, emphasis on small businesses, the employers, co-working spaces, and certainly have conversations with you. I'm just not sure if there's an ask or board commissioners have their legislators here today. Yeah, um, I think the incubator hub co-working space that we've been working on, you guys were so gracious to provide us with an incubator feasibility study about two and a half years ago. And we have given that to our small business strategist, which then kind of dialed it down until we know what we need to do. And the whole kind of hanging fruit is in finding that staff person to make it be able to be a possibility. So we, and I would say the other part of this, is with Elevate Douglas and the Chamber and our joint service agreement. We are also looking at the potential of a new shared space, which then it's kind of this, 
you know those little puzzles that you have when you're a child and it's got the little discs and this thing has to happen to move it here to make the picture look right? I feel like that's what we're living and breathing in our organization right now. So we're looking at a potential new space that will house all of our staff and then looking at what we end up, uh, you know, what ends up happening with our chamber office, with, uh, with um, Chris's office. So we're thinking that we kind of are looking at those being one of those spaces. So as far as funding an incubator and co-working space for 22, I don't know if that, or yeah, 22, I don't know if that's necessarily something that will be happening because we're still going through that feasibility process. But I would say if there's an ask um, from the chamber in regards to support from the board of commissioners, we would love to have some support as we look at building out those small business initiatives, whether it's support towards the staffing, which then drives all of those resources and programming. It could be supporting our This is Douglas initiative as we build that out and help people in our community. It builds the community pride within, and then we are able to, when Chris goes out to you know, bring in the big projects, they're seeing that community pride through the website that we have established, and they're hearing it from the, they're hearing it from the people and the businesses that are here. It's not coming from Sarah, it's not coming from Chris, it's not coming from the chairman, it's coming from the heart of our community. So we've just found that that's very important. And I would add specifically on that individual, we had a, a particular budget range for what that salary might be, but as we got deeper into it, we realized that we were a pretty significant number of thousands away like, yeah. um, from being able to afford that. And so, you know, as Sarah list, listed, there's a lot of things up that what individual would be looking to accomplish. So that's why we brought on kind of an intermediate strategist to help us move some of these pieces forward. Um, but from a salary range, it's pretty significant. So that'd be very helpful. What is the range? Yeah, I would say the, 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 range, the range is north is north of $100,000. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we budgeted about seventy or 80000 this year to find someone. And when we started talking to our colleagues in other communities, they were like, yeah, you're going to have to go higher than that. And especially when you look at if, if, if in establishing that incubator co-working space, that's a team of probably eight or ten that that person would eventually kind of pass the torch to to be supervising. So Facebook is starting a whole new business. So okay, great. Thank you guys Thank you. so much. not my forte talking in front of people. I can tell you that. I'm more behind the scenes doing the exhibits and designs. So, um, we're located in the old courthouse. If you haven't been, you need to come because we get rave reviews from all over the country. Um, we are a commission. Of the museum is operated by a commission. It is appointed by the Board of Commissioners. That commission actually saved this building from being de demolished. And then now it's full of county offices, so that's a big asset to the county that that building didn't get torn down. Yeah, Serving and telling our story of our citizens and our, celebrating our citizens is our main goal. Because people, well, to get new businesses here, they want to see what you have in arts and culture. That is big for bringing, helping Chris and helping the chamber. The Hydrangea Festival is um, a tourism event we created, and it brought people from 13 states this past year, which was exciting. It's dark. Um, we had win national awards and state awards, top in the nation. We have all kinds of distinguished guests that come to visit our museum, and they are so proud of it. They don't even know how we got everything. We, everything that's in the museum has been given to us by our citizens. And when they come, they think, oh, I've got something for my family that I would love to bring. And we're so happy about that because we don't go out and search our history. It comes to us. Um, the Native American exhibit that's up right now, which you need to see, we got recognized by David Scott. He wrote us a wonderful letter about how wonderful this exhibit was and what it's bringing to our community. We partnered with the city to do a shoebox parade for the Fourth of July parade, and we had a 99 floats in the museum that people would come and see. Our Douglas County Hall of Fame is pretty amazing. If you don't know who's been in Douglas County and who's lived here and what they're doing, 
it is so fascinating. We have actors, we have inventors, we have Olympians. It's unbelievable. We just found out this year, well, it was 2020, um, about a Douglas County Nine. And these were nine African Americans that fought in France in World War I. And their story is amazing. So I've, looked, I've brought some flyers on that story if you want one. We're all the time finding some new history about our county that's just really, truly amazing. We're constantly refining our exhibits. One of the things that we did during, when we were closed for COVID was um, revamp some of our exhibits, which was great. Uh, of course, our challenges were the same as everybody else's. And then we, were, we operated on hotel motel tax, and that was taken away from us this year. So um, we had to shorten our work staff and do other things to save money. Um, our 2020, we did not have the hydrangea festival in 2020. And then our attendance was lower because we had to close. But we had a wonderful exhibit about our county's 150 history. And a lot of people didn't get to see that. And the county had a lot of celebrations planned and that didn't get to happen. 2021, we've had a, we had a record breaking hydrangea festival. Um, the museum attendance has been record breaking. Um, we had the passing of our director, so I am just acting. Um, she did everything for the museum, and so we're in complete reorganization. Uh, so we did enhance a lot of our uh, exhibits during the pandemic, and we are constantly gathering history. So if you have any about your family, we'd love to have it. We're gonna have a bigger and better hydrangea festival this year. We've been um, spread out into different locations. Um, we're gonna get a new sign on the back of our building, which sometimes you're flying down Veterans Memorial Highway and you don't see our marquee. So we're gonna have one when you're slower on uh, Church Street on the back side. And an uh, installation of a kiosk, which I don't know exactly what that's gonna entail, but that's from the DCTT which is the Douglas County Tourism and Travel. Uh, and uh, we enhanced our visitor centers just <coughs> that we tell the Douglas County story. We are enhancing our promotion of the Douglas County Film Trail, the Butterfly Trail, and our existing registry of historic places. We're, our goal is to stabilize our funding so we know where we can go and what we can do. We are creating a historic site trail for visitors, so when they come to the um, Douglas County, they have a place to go. And create a membership program and continue recruitment of volunteers and interns. We work with West Georgia on interns. And the new exhibit that was inspired by our chairman is um, for, night, for January, the opening in February, is Douglas County women making history. Did you, was the map up there of where people had been? Did you oh, skip that? Skip that. I'm sorry. It was the second slide, I think. Did it show that? I just didn't see it. The map that flagged. All right, look at this. This is who, these people came to see this museum this year, all those uh, countries and all those states. It's pretty amazing what we, the tourism we draw. Any questions for me? Thank you. Okay. I've got my photo. We've got one now. <laughs> no, the parade was to go. <laughs> No, thank you for that, that update. Um, one of the things I, 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 I do appreciate you sharing that I thought was new was um, the work with the trail system um, and bringing awareness to that. When I read that, I'm like, okay, now we're cooking. No, seriously. In fact, that, like, okay. And um, again, uh, the fact I heard that you're doing 
um, different diverse exhibits. Now, I'm not sure you hadn't shared that with us. Whatever she, if that were you and the chair she was referring to, there's something was coming about women and I mean that that's a good thing coming up this year, which is good. But um, right, you know, you know, what would you say? How to say that? You, know, you don't search your history; your history comes to you. That that, that notion. And you know, I think about my my children were born here, but I wasn't born here, so I'm. I'm like, how do I extend my history with that? And it, 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 but, but it sounds like you recognize that there's, there's differences. Uh, you recognize that, that everybody contributes to their part of history. And, um, and I, 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 I can appreciate that, um, that, that. And so when I think about, well, I get the building. And I hear all these needs from you know, Chris and, and Sarah and Nelson and this thing. Okay, guys, we're at, we're at a tipping point. I hear Coach Ars need. I'm like, okay, we, we, this leadership group has a chance to really shape the history of this kind of for the next hundred years. So let's my karma well, us back to now, hundred years from now. It'd be much easier, much easier to search. But you get it, it it's, it's about extending forward and capturing things today so that the people who come after us will be able to see that history, you know? And, and I get it, it's hard, it's, it's interesting going back to 1870 because it was, it's a different type of search. But, but history is, is always rolling, right? It's always, it, it lives and breathes, it ebbs and flows based on who comes in and out. But I, I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing, at least there's some acknowledgement. I understand there's a funding issue. Sounds like there's a leadership issue as well that you, you I know you're just stepping in and stuff, but. I'm sure I'm not certain what, you, I know you've had some conversation regarding that. I can only speak for myself. I'm, I'm open, but I'm hoping it's, it's part of a bigger picture. Like, if we're gonna do this, do it right. Do it right. And that's all I gotta say. I'm, I'm encouraged by, by the, the shift. And I think from last year to this year, all this is new now. This whole room, everything, we're all, now we're finally talking. Now we're finally all getting on the same page. And I'm encouraged by that. So I just thank you for sharing and, and having the courage to, to come and talk to us. No, it, it really matters, at least from my perspective. I appreciate you sharing that. And I did want to acknowledge the work you did out there with the farm and stuff like that. Okay, now that's what, I, I like that. So I saw you, at least I heard you. Thank you.
How are you today? I'm great. How are you guys? Yes. Now, y'all got to wake up. Come on now. I know I'm the last one. You've been here all day. You had breakfast. You had lunch. But come on now. Uh, my name is Dee Dee Artis. I'm the Douglas County DFAX Director. Um, and so, you know, I'm representing an agency that most people don't want to talk about um, because we see the worst, but we also see the best in our, in our folks and the people that we serve in the county. And so what I want to share with you guys this, today is kind of a little snapshot of what we do how we do it, our challenges, and what our ask is of the board. So again, to the board, thank you very much for this invite uh, today. So I, I could go on, I could probably have 20 slides of our accomplishments and 20 slides of our challenges, but I tried to just kind of pinpoint some highlights. So one thing that we have accomplished during, even through this pandemic, is we have finalized uh, 12 adoptions of our children. These are children who were able to be returned back home to their biological families due to one reason or another. And so we are, we are charged with finding permanent homes. We don't want children aging out of foster care. We are not good parents, I'll just be honest with you. They are best suited in a home that is forever that that child can come back to on holidays and graduations and things like that. So we were afforded the opportunity to um, have these 12 children be adopted by these families. This is National Adoption Month. I don't know if you know about that, but this is. So we are celebrating these families later on this month, kind of raising them up and um, standing tall and, and committing to care for these children who are not their own for the rest of their lives. So that is a huge accomplishment. We have another 18 children who are on what we call adoptive status. 10 of those do have adoption resources, so they are already placed in a home that we are just waiting to finalize their adoptions, but we do have other children who are looking for that forever home. Um, we installed a security system in our building. Now, some of you may not know who operates in our building, but you have DFAX, you have the uh, Child Support Agency, and you have community supervision and probation. So you can imagine, people who come to our building don't like us, right? They don't like coming to us. And so sometimes we get very angry clients, not just in defects, but probation and child support. And so it can be an unsafe environment for our staff. Two years ago, we had someone ram their car through our front window. Just last summer, we had someone chain lock our front doors, um, which prevented our staff in case of a fire that we could not get out. But we didn't have any security cameras, neither inside nor outside the building. And so with our county budget, we were able to purchase eight indoor or eight total cameras, four indoor and four outdoor, surrounding the perimeter so that we can keep an eye on, you know, what's going in and out and keep our staff safe. There's many times where you guys are all sleeping at two in the morning. Me and my staff are in the office. We're awake because we have a foster child who doesn't have a placement and we are in our offices. So, you know, going out at two in the morning, um, going in and out of these buildings, we want to keep our uh, staff safe. Uh, we also were able to this year update our foster parent reimbursement protocol. Many times um, our foster parents are not reimbursed for such basics as diapers for kids, haircuts for our foster youth, uh, birthday gifts and events and school pictures, school um, instruments. And so this year we have been afforded along with our budget to go ahead and upgrade that protocol which has really please a lot of our foster parents so that our kids are not going without because even though they are not our biological kids if they are in our foster care system they are our kids and so we are not going to treat them any different and they are you know um, afforded everything that your child or my child would receive um, we also have done some recruitment events for our foster parents we are in need of foster parents for our foster youth we have approximately 224 children in foster care. Only 60 of them are in a defects foster home. That means we are utilizing other resources and other providers in order to house our kids here in Doug for Douglas County. Our kids are spread out throughout the entire state, Savannah, Macon, Milledgeville, Valdosta. My staff every month are making those visits to those areas of the state to go see those children face to face. We gotta bring these kids back home, but we gotta have foster parents to do that. So we've been doing some recruitment events. We were at the Peace Rally at the Douglasville Police Department. We also participated in the Douglasville Fall Festival. Um, so we are trying to recruit for foster parents. If you are interested, come see me. Uh, I'll give you some information. Um, but some challenges, staff turnover. 
That's one of our number one reasons. I've heard it a common theme today is that, um, you know, the workforce. It is, it is an employee's market out there. 35% uh, of my staff make less than 30,000 a year. With staff turnover, you have high caseloads. My CPS case managers who work um, knocking on the doors when we get allegations of maltreatment of children, they carry an average caseload of 25 a month. My foster care case managers are at 30. The National Association of Social Workers recommends 15 per worker. So we are well above, even doubled in foster care, the amount of caseloads that we should be carrying. My OFI staff who manage your, um, the applications for food stamps, Medicaid, um, TANF, they carry approximately 1,000 families on their caseload. Staff turnover has been a huge impact on our job. Support services for identified high-risk um, youth. These are our children who are um, in the LGBTQ population. They are struggling not only with the trauma of child abuse, but also where do they fit in with their sexual preferences. Untreated mental health, just traumatized children, autistic children. Uh, we don't have enough resources to meet their needs. And then uh, the staff safety in the community home. We have not stopped going into our um, clients' homes throughout this pandemic. We still knock on their doors, we sit in their uh, living rooms and have hard conversations about child abuse and neglect. So those have been some of the challenges. Um, I'm not gonna go over all these numbers. I think you guys can read them. This is just a comparative chart of how, how many we have processed in these different areas in 2020 versus how many we have processed thus far as of September 2021. We are on target to meet our, our um, same amounts as we did in 2020 and probably surpass those in some of those areas. The one thing I do want to point out with this slide is that we have had a huge decrease in our exits of our foster children. And because of the pandemic, resources have been very limited, um, staff turnover, you know, you, the child is, has multiple case managers, so there's not uh, staff continuity with these cases, and so sometimes these kids just kind of fall in the cracks, unfortunately. So that's kind of been our comparative analysis. So my goal is to, one, make sure that Douglas County DFAX has a robust workforce. We want to retain our staff. Uh, we want to incentivize our staff. We want to equip them to become emerging leaders. I don't want my case managers to always just want to be a case manager. I want to build a case manager to take my position when I'm ready to exit out and retire one day. Um, community connections, we got to keep those up. You've heard the saying, it takes a village to um, raise a child. We've got to be involved with these community uh, folks um, to do that and to meet these needs. And then lastly is reducing the number of children in foster care. 224 is one too many. And so we need to make sure that we are putting services in in order to try and stabilize these homes so these children can go back. So what's my ask of the board? <laughs> Not a whole lot, but a little bit. Um, as far as the county budget, what I'm asking for is just an increase of $2,000 from last year's budget. We were at, you guys gave us 63,918. I'm asking for 65,000. That $2,000 would go into meeting the needs of our children who are ages 14 years and older to meet some of those reimbursable items. However, I will say the board, um, I sent you a thank you email, but I want to say it publicly that you guys had approved a supplement for my staff to be used from our fund balance. I can't tell you how appreciative that was for my staff. We haven't received across the board raise since 2019, and we're not, it's not in the works to get one now. And so our staff is going, doing the work, not getting compensated for. So they were very appreciative of that. So what I am projecting is that we provide two supplements next year. One would be an additional, something similar to what we did this um, winter, uh, where it would be based on tenure of my staff. But then the other one would be a summer incentive. It would be for all employees who have completed one year of employment as of July 1st, 2022. And it would be across the board $250 per employee. That equals to a little bit about $18,000 should we fill all our vacancies. And then with projecting what um, the other supplement in the fall would be, we're probably looking right around sixty-two dollars to $65,000 that we would be looking at supplements next year 
and this would come from our fund balance. Questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Artis. Any questions from the board? Ms. Artis, you said that your uh, most of your caseworkers make less than thirty thousand uh, dollars. Who pays the salary? Do, do we set the salary, or do does the state or what? So the the salaries are paid through our state budget, and they are set by our state government. So uh, can the county supplement your salaries, uh, the salary part, not just bonuses, but supplement the? Not that I'm aware of. I'm not aware of. I tried. <laughs> we are, uh, we do have an association um, of professionals within our human services, and they are working on advocating uh, next year, one of our goals is to advocate for higher salaries for our staff. So we do have someone helping. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Artis. Great presentation. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. What do we have next, County Administrator? So at this point, all presentations are wrapped up. I just want to make one quick comment. I want to acknowledge um, Ms. Artis before she leaves to Madam Guyer's point. Part of the legislation that we're looking at for a, a, a living wage, $15 across the board, was consideration was given to everybody that, that the board commissioner funds, this would impact. In talking legal, we realized that well, our, we can't reach that far. There may be restrictions, statutory or otherwise, that would block that. But that was the intent of that, that any, any agency, any department, if the Board of Commissioners funded, it would now be this you know, $15 minimum, but, but we couldn't reach there. So I think we're on the same page on that one. So now I'm telling you, I know somebody up at the state legislative, the, the delegation, can y'all go make a phone call for us? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair. I'm trying to I'm trying to get um, vice chair's number. I'm trying to beat the challenge. <laughs> um, so that brings us to the end of our presentations. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for I'd like to thank everybody for putting in the, the extra effort. I'm also really glad that they stayed for this whole part because um, when I asked about previous um, budget retreats, nobody could tell me because nobody had attended before. So this is a good opportunity for all these directors, especially new directors, to hear how this process works. It may not be exactly how you've done it before, but it's important for me that they understand the whole, not just their individual silo. They get to hear from outside agencies. They get to hear from each other. They get to hear your questions. And they get to hear from Roz on, on kind of how, how the money works. So thank you all very much. Um, at this point, commissioners, really what I'm looking for is some input from you. If you want us to delve into specific budgets, uh, we will have a list for you of all the asks by department with all the backup, but that's very voluminous. I don't think you want to go through that today, but if you do, we're prepared. Um, and on the question asked by Commissioner Robinson, of the ARPA funding in year one, um, Seven million and thirty-seven five hundred and forty-four dollars was dedicated to staff. Um, the one-time bonus, the vaccine um, incentive, the three, the five percent or ten percent um, in year one, depending on whether you are public safety or or regular class employees, and that was forty-nine point six percent. So I would say, give yourselves a hand. Half of the money in year one, you all dedicated to employees. And then in year two, the percentages were smaller, um, but it was another 3,752 
sorry, 3,752,107, and that was 26% in year two. So the total was 10,789,651 of our ARPA is being dedicated to employees. Can I ask one question? It gives me a relative to all those, right? Are we being sure. consistent? Are we being emotional at the one time? Are we setting a true policy statement? If not, we don't stick with it. And then, you know, we're, we're letting a week away or a couple weeks away from making real long term decisions about how we now treat and pay, compensate, train, and get up our staff to get higher performance and higher productivity. This is all related. I'm only at one goal. Y'all got to go to the press, but it, it matters. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I won't get a review, but yeah, y'all heard me. Um, uh, yeah, I think you get the spirit. So I, I won't belabor this moment. Um, um, I, mean, I mean, this was good. This was different. I, I am sensitive. I, I probably would have, though my, my heart is to get into the numbers, y'all did need to see this. Because if I think about the 13 years, some of you have been brought in, strategically come in, make a presentation, and left. This is the first time you guys, and, and so for that, I think it was good that you guys are here and got to see this and stuff. That's why I didn't do my normal grilling. It's like, no, 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 I was suppressed. It's like, no, no, no. Let, let them go. Let, let, let everybody have their moment and stuff. So, um, but we, we, we too got to get work done too, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a two-way street. So I think this was a good forum. I'm not certain how much more I can go deep into, I, I just want the numbers so I can go and do what I do, but I'm open to my peers since that was the question that was asked. I mean, how much do y'all want to go? I'm trying to yield to your leadership. Thank you so much. Oh, right she's here. Oh, yeah. Okay, Sharon. Yeah, thank you so much, Vice Chair. So we kind of administer the baby on the response to this question. Is that what you're doing? Do we have, is our uh, chief financial advisor coming in today? Or? Um, so he had some conflicts today. He was trying to rearrange his uh, schedule to be able to be here. I'm not sure. I haven't heard from him today. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming some of what he had that he couldn't rearrange ran long. So, um, and Commissioner Robinson, part two of your question was of the increment, yep. how much went to employees? Um, 1.243 million and 51, which was 26% in, in the current year budget. And some of those were changes that had been made in last year that we have to continue on for this year. All right, got that, 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 you answered my question. So mm -hmm. feedback, all right, so if, how, how would y'all wanna do feedback? Uh, Cause this is new. Um, historically, we've done where we would tell the finance director, um, Ross, in this case, okay, well, here's what I want to sponsor. Put this on my tab. And her job is to keep up with our comments. Mm -hmm. and at some point, we will all get in the room, as you guys know, we can throw up the gun and reconcile that 1% just swing out. I'm not certain I had to I, I do that in this moment. Because um, I got to reconcile the Constitution, I got to reconcile mm -hmm. you guys, I got to reconcile the agencies, right? I've, I've got to reconcile the citizens, so it's like, I can throw some stuff out to you, I've got a list, but I'm, I'm sensitive to, how do y'all want to handle this? I mean, we get to make the rules, so I mean, there's nothing that prohibits us how we do this, but you want to put it in writing, y'all want to talk about it? I mean, okay. Are you going to put it in writing? Yeah, so we can, mm -hmm. we can go through the So what we'll do is give you everybody's request. Yes. You think by Monday or Tuesday? By Monday? Yeah. Well, you tell them. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. So they've, they've submitted their request, but what I'd like to do is summarize it, but give you the backup. That way, you know, if you see. And you're going to give us exactly what they are? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's why it was 29 million. If it was up to me, I'd be like, no, nah, you can't have that. 
I know it's, it's just a very little bit of list. Yeah. So, but we'll, we'll give you everything, and then you can kind of, you know. The one thing I will say is there's there's a pretty big list on personnel increase, you know, but I think you've done that already. Yeah. So, um, in terms of increases, so that's the one category that I, I think you know reasonably. I would say everybody is really happy with that. Um, I can't speak to the constitutional. Some of them are asking for more. But um, you know, as we talked about it, I think everybody felt that the board had really extended on the personnel piece. But you're going to see that in the list because it's what they asked for. All right. Actually, the, the, the uh, district commissioners had a sponsor of certain things. You would maybe housing for. Um, Judge Allen, so those things, that's what we've done in the past, not specifically with, you know, putting these down in the budget, because that's already done, primarily. We just look at things that they, that the district commissioners want to sponsor, and they may have a list of things. So you get the list, but I was just saying, you, you can get the list, but I just think things that we've sponsored, I don't know how, how deep you all want to go, that's, that's certainly, you know. Can I respond? Yes, please. Yeah. No, no, and again, back to if you give them insight into, so, so what happens when we make the spaghetti? So at the end of this meeting, typically we would go in a room, and we have to call personnel. That's what would happen. And typically two things, we, we really talk about how do we give away, uh, what we say come up with, I mean, it, it used to be people coming in with a list of people who asked for a salary, who was suggested to get an increase. We talk about y'all, not staff, y'all. That's how this works. And we'll sit there like, okay, we have to evaluate. We don't know how to evaluate any of them. So we would just appropriate a bucket of money and allow the county administrator. You figure it out. We had no formal way to do that. Other than now, we have a formal way to evaluate. That, that, so just to give you insight in how that works, um, we would appropriate, um, obviously, money that way um, and evaluate that way. But. Um, I just figured that you would want to know how that actually works. And so if the now new rule is that, well, salaries should stay fixed. No, no, no enter salary during the middle of the year. That's doing off your, you know, messing with your, 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 your messing with her policy. And, and so, you know, it's one of those things, this is, the, this is the time, you know, the annual, think about federal government, it's once a year. This is the time you should ask. This is the time that you should advocate. Right? This is the time that you should, we don't, it's not personal with us, we, are, we still only got one dollar, but the point is that to Madam Chair's point, it's our discretion. And so if three people land on the same reason for any, any area, any one thing, it is what it is, but it's only about the penny. 95% of it is already set, we know that. So don't get it wrong, but that, 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 that three votes matter. It matters, so I hope that was helpful, but I mean, I mean give them insight, because I think they really need to see how this really worked. I mean, it's that simple. Three of us, I mean, we're like, no, we get in room. Any one person can bring something up. I'm like, okay, well, right? And that's just the discretion. Uh, but I think this this now allows us to see you guys. And this was good. You you did much better this year than last year. Last year, y'all were a little, but this one, this one was tight. Oh, this was virtual, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah but this is, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't like virtual, but you know, <laughs> that's personal. But no, I, I felt, that's something I felt the other day. Like, oh no, this was the energy. This is what I'm saying, you know, no more avatars and stuff. So this was good for me to connect with you guys, to feel it on another level, because I have to feel you right now. I can't see you anyway. So for me, it was, it was less impactful, but this one was good, so I appreciate you guys taking the time and preparing for this. And you got to sell your points across. Like, no, I got it. That's why I just need to listen. You hit it, key points, but um, I'll yield. I mean, Madam Chair, I'll. Yeah. How do you want to handle the rest of that? I'm sorry. On the agenda, there's. David's not here. He's not here. So the next is executive session. I don't believe there's a need for executive session. Or if that's the case, Thank guess you. what? It is Friday. Go Braves. We have a gift of time and we appreciate all of your presentations. Great job. And you have left something for all of us. I love it for the commissioners to chew on and we'll go from there. So we thank you so much for having a great Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.